Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm thrilled to have two very respected men here tonight, Dr. Kent Hoven and Conspiracy Cats. They're going to talk about evolution. They're going to debate it. Um, Jared here is mostly doing the moderating. I'm going to help out a little bit. And I'll kick it off to you, Jared. Oh, wait, one second. All the um, Streamlabs Super Chats and um, donations are going straight to the fund to help TNT, our friend. And um, everything will be read out just like a regular Super Chat. Go ahead, Jared. Oh, good evening, everyone. For those who are unaware, I am Jared of AT2 Productions, here to help moderate this wonderful debate and discussion between Dr. Dino, Kent Hovind, and Conspiracy Cats. So, I expect to be as quiet as a church mouse. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we have that right, gentlemen, correct? <laughs> mm -hmm. So... For those who are unaware, uh, this is actually going to be a formal debate setup where we do have a couple timed presentations, then a timed rebuttal period for each of the, uh, I, I don't really want to use the word, but it is fitting, combatants. And then we will end the show with a open back and forth and a couple minutes of questions from the audience. So, without further ado, we are going to go in order of how the presentations are going to be. So, if you would like to introduce yourself to the audience, Conspiracy Cats, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, my name is Conspiracy Cats. My channel is Conspiracy Cats. Uh, I've got another channel called Baldy Cats as well. Uh, mainly, I've been dealing with uh, anti-flat earth uh, nonsense, really. So, I'm looking forward to, to this, you know, something that's got a bit more... Uh, science in it, a bit more meaty. So I'm looking forward to this. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Hovind as well for bobbing over. I'm looking forward to this. So nice to meet you, sir. Good to meet you. And with that, for those who might be culturally unaware, mm -hmm. Dr. Hovind, go ahead and introduce yourself to the wonderful audience that we have out there. All right. Well, yeah, sir. my name's Kent Hovind. I just turned 67 yesterday. Oh, two days God ago. bless. That's the oldest I've ever been. Kind of a steady race to the grave. Uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I've been an ordained Baptist preacher for 45 years, been a Christian for 51 years, and I taught high school science and math for 15 years. And about 30 years ago, began a ministry called Creation Science Evangelism. I defend the position that the Bible is literally true, scientifically accurate. It's correct, just like it's written. God made everything, that would mean everything, in six days, including dinosaurs. They always lived with man. So our website is drdino.com. Our phone number is 855-BIG-DINO. I'm extension three if you want to talk to me. And <clears throat> we defend the position the Bible is true and the evolution theory is the dumbest and most dangerous religion in the history of the world. Well, hopefully we can make some headway to see where the actual truth lies between those two positions today. And with that, give me just a moment and we will be ready to go with the initial presentation from Conspiracy Cats himself. So, let me go ahead and just do the couple of clicks that I need to do. There's that. And... Mr. Katz, the floor is yours. Yeah. Time to go. Right, so this isn't going to be a debate where I sit here and just try and defend and defend and defend evolution uh, against somebody that thinks evolution is ridiculous. What we're going to do in this debate, what I'm going to make sure we're going to do is look at both sides of the argument. And we're going to see which side of the argument uh, is, is more scientifically sound. How, how does creation... Uh, against science stand up when compared to evolution. So we're going to start with some claims that Dr. Hovind has made over and over and over again. And, and, and uh, Mr. Dr. Hovind, if you think I'm misquoting you at any point, just, just butt in and tell me, okay? Okay. Right. So I've heard Dr. Hovind say many, many times that the Earth is about 6,000 years old. And about 4,000 years ago, there was a, a big flood, which essentially wiped out all the creatures, creatures on the planet, apart from uh, those that were, were saved on Noah's Ark. Uh, and those individual animals were the first of a kind, which then speciated uh, to get all the different species we've got now. So let's look at the science of the flood. I've also heard uh, Dr. Hovind say that 
um, that this flood, obviously it was a very quick flood, it drained very, very quickly. Uh, and as it drained quickly, that's where we got the layers of strata and that's where all the fossils were deposited. Have I misquoted you at any point yet, Dr. Ovindo? Is that about what you'd say? Well, a little bit. I would say 4,400 years ago was the flood, according to the Bible, and the, it wasn't the draining of the lake that caused the strata. The strata probably formed during the flood with the yeah. tidal chain, tide going up and down. So it'd be during the flood, most of it. Pretty close. Yeah. Getting close. So, so the, the, the strata formed extremely quickly. So we've got to, we, let's, let's look at that claim to start with. We have the flood. We have the, the, the strata forming, these layers forming during the flood. We have this fast flowing water with sediment coming out of suspension. Now, let's have a look at what we see when things come out of suspension in the real world. You can see by the picture I've got in front of you there. When that happens in the real world every single day, in our, you know, our observable, uh, you know, the world around us, we see density layers form. We see the most dense uh, uh, sediment sink into the bottom to be covered by layers and layers that are subsequently less dense as you go higher. But when we look at the rocks around us, that is not what we see. We don't look at the Grand Canyon and see a decrease in density. When we look all over the world, we see uh, layers of rock that are mixed in density. This very, very fundamental thing flies in the face of what Dr. Hovind is saying. Nowhere in science do we ever, ever see uh, this sort of process, sedimentation that gives us a mixture of layers. So what I'll be challenging Dr. Hovind on later on is can he actually explain using science why when we look at the, the strata in the real world, are they not? Uh, in order of decrease in density from bottom to top. And, and I'm really going to want that answer uh, from you. We're not going to dance around that. Can I have the next slide as well, please? Thank you, Jared. Uh, right. But it's not just the sediment that the, the floodwaters have ignored. If we look at uh, the fossils as well, it seems that the floodwater hasn't had, a, uh, or the density of the fossils hasn't had any effect either. We don't see the biggest, heaviest, most dense fossils at the bottom. We don't see the, the lightest ones at the top. We see anything but that. It's almost as if the density of the sediment and the density of the fossils have absolutely no link whatsoever in, in terms of where they fall. But again, that's not what we see in science, in the real world. So again, I'm going to be asking Dr. Hovind afterwards, can he actually scientifically justify and give me examples of where I can see things not conforming to what we know are the laws of physics? Can I have the next slide, please, Jerry? But if we go further on, we can talk about the water having a complete mind of itself. Not only has it completely ignored density when it's been dropping the layers, but it's also taken time to deliberately organize the layers of fossils in increasing complexity. The most simple single cell uh, organisms, uh, the deeper down we go, becoming more and more complex as we go up. The water almost has a mind of its own and has arranged those for us. When we use radioactive dating, and I know Dr. Hoven is going to challenge me on this later on, and I really, really hope he does because I'm looking forward to that conversation. But radioactive dating as well, when we go down through those layers, radio radioactive dating shows an earth that is far, far older than 6,000 years. It shows fossils that are far, far older than 6,000 years old. And again, the water seems to have taken these fossils and put them in an order of increasing age as shown by radioactive dating. Again, it's almost like the water has a mind of its own and it's trying to trick us. Now, this is the same all over the world. It's not just in one part. This, this is worldwide. Now, when we look at uh, fossils, such as, sorry, I'm just blabbed a little bit there. When we look at dinosaurs or humans, we also never, ever, ever, ever find fossils out of place. We never find a human uh, fossil next to a dinosaur fossil. It's like the water itself has got a mind of our own. And this leaves me with two points. If we're going to start the assumption off, because I'm not going to argue with you on, on uh, religion, so I, I'm just going to say from the word off, my personal beliefs have got nothing to do with it. Let's say God exists. OK, and, and then this isn't an argument against an atheist. Let's just say God exists. Why would God trick us? Why would God create uh, a whole different set of laws of physics for the deposition after the flood or during the flood that we've never seen since? Why would he create such different laws to trick us into thinking the flood didn't happen? But it gets a little bit crazier than that. So if we can just skip on to the next side, Joe, please. So. 4,400 years ago, you said, was the flood. And after the flood, these animals that were taken onto the ark, these living creatures, these living things that were taken onto the ark, these kinds, if you like, they then speciated. And I've heard you yourself say that you think speciation is a, a thing. You, you, you're you happy with microevolution, yeah? 
it depends on what you mean by the word microevolution, but yes, uh, very variations certainly happen within the kind. No, no argument. Okay. Okay, so let's just take a look at how scientifically valid this argument actually is then. Let's take a simple animal like a rabbit. Now, there's well over 300 rabbits, well over 300 rabbit species on the planet. If we go back four to 5,000 years with the number of rabbit species we've got now, since that first rabbit kind stepped off the ark, we've got to have a new species of rabbit every 12 and a half years every 12 and a half years to get all the rabbits we've got now if we've come from a single kind. But obviously, I don't think he's taken just, if you're going to use the word kind, I think you'd maybe class a her as a, as a rabbit kind. So we can go on to the next slide as well. If we then factor in all the species of her, and you'll notice the Christmas hat on there because uh, it was Christmas when we were supposed to do this debate first time. I've not changed the PowerPoint since. Maybe I should have changed the picture. But if he was going to include her in the rabbit kind, then suddenly we need a new species every eight years. Now, I have absolutely no idea of any animal the size of a, a rabbit that creates a new species every eight years. And I'll be challenging you again later on, if you don't answer these questions, to give me examples of animals that are speciating so regularly, splitting, you know, creating new species so regularly, because to me, they just don't exist. But it gets even well, we could even have the peaker to that as well, couldn't we? And then we're looking at new species every five or six years. But if we come away from rabbits, and if I can have the next slide, please, Jerry. We could maybe look at the fly kind. Now, I'm not up to speed with the scripture. I don't know if flies went on the ark or if flies are 6,000 years old. So let's look at both. If they went, if they were, if they were, uh, if they went on the ark with 120,000 species of flies, we'd need a new species of fly uh, to be arriving every, uh, just just less than every two weeks, all right? 30 new species a year we would be getting if they didn't, uh, if they if they didn't, uh, sorry, if they went on the ark. If they didn't go on the ark, we'd still be needing 20 new species every year. So still nearly one new species of fly a fortnight. But is a fly kind the kind? Or do we lump other things in with it? So if I can have the next slide, please, Jared. If you're going to talk about kind, would wasp be a fly kind? Would a, would a bee or a, an aphid, would they be fly kind? If so, if we're totaling well over a million species. We're needing a new species to be created from that first original kind that you're going to call it. We need that to be created just every few days. There is no species out there, that is, there is no, no animal out there or living organism out there that is creating new species at this pace, and I will be challenging you and, and holding your feet to the fire if you can't give me an example of speciation that happens that quickly, because this is, these are the real numbers, this is the real maths, this is the reality of the situation. We have over a million of these fly kind, so why are they not speciating uh, as regular? But we could go on to the next slide, please, Joe. And we could talk, uh, which is, sorry, uh, to the next one, I've put two in there for some reason. Thanks. So we could go on and we could talk just about beetles. And, you know, we're not even putting beetles with fly kind. And again, assuming they weren't on the ark because they could fly. Again, we need more than one species, one new species every single week to reach the maximum number of species we've got now. But we just don't see it. We just don't see anything splitting off into different species that often. So just a bit of a recap before I go a little bit further. We do not see anywhere the laws of physics operate in the way that you need them to operate to produce these layers of rock that are in different densities, not a set, not descending density. We don't see any laws of physics that makes water intelligent to sort out uh, organisms from less complex to most complex. We don't see speciation happening at the rate it needs to happen. None of these things happen. And unless you can provide some sort of evidence as to as to why you think this can happen, then your argument has already failed before you've even spoken. But let's have a look at the reliability of the Bible and how we can take it literally. Can we just skip on to the next one? Now, this again isn't about being religious or not being religious or atheist or not. It's just looking at can we take the Bible literally? Here is a passage I'm sure you're familiar with, and I'm going to hold my hand up. I did pinch this from Fight the Flat Earth. Um, so if he's watching, thanks, buddy. Um, you know, a little passage in the Bible where somebody is being told by God to create an impossible physical object. Now, you said in the uh, in the build up to this offer that you used to teach geometry for 15 years. So I'm sure by looking at that, you know why that is a, a perfectly impossible object. But yet God is in, uh, 
is in, uh, implying that that can be made. And for those people that haven't seen that before, essentially, you can't make a circle of those dimensions because pi would end up being 3, not 3.14. It's a physically impossible object to make. So another thing, I haven't got the slide for this, but also when we're talking about the age of the Bible, and I'd like your opinion on this later on as well, uh, God didn't say uh, to, to Adam and Eve, go and populate the earth. God said to Adam and Eve, go and replenish, replenish the earth. As if life had been there before Adam and Eve. So there's lots of contradictions, but I'm, I'm not into scripture, so I'm not going to stick with those too much. But if we can skip on to the next slide, please, um, Jared, thanks. So we go back to what we actually can see, what we actually know. And what we actually know are we do have these layers of fossils. That is a fact. You can see them. We do have these layers of rock. That is a fact. We can see them. Sorry, someone's speaking there. I'm getting feedback. No, it's, right, sorry. So we, this is a fact. Now, I know that if we were only talking about fossils as evidence for evolution, then, you know, you, it could be argued there's a lot of interpretation. It could be argued that fossils are put together incorrectly. Um, you know, and even though we get there in the end, you know, there'd be a room for a lot of flaws. So how do we take other bits of evidence and back up this fossil record? Well, we look at genetics. Can we skip two slides on, please? And this will be the last thing I say, because I know I'm droning on a bit, and then I'll pass it over to, to Kemp. Kemp, I'm sure you're familiar because you've been doing this for a long time, right? This, you've done over 200 debates. We can see that on the screen. I'm sure you're familiar with what uh, um, ERVs are, endogenous retroviral DNA insertions. Okay, now we know that these are insertions that viruses put into our DNA, and they've all got the same characteristic structure. They've all got the gag gene, the pol gene, the EMV gene, and these long terminal repeats on either side. And we know what those genes do. One of the genes causes the the caps uh, the, the the capsid around the virus. One of them contains reverse transcriptase, which is a purely viral enzyme. Um, in this, um, um, and the EMV one has. A couple of different uh, jobs, but uh, essentially it allows a virus to enter uh, enter a cell. Now, these retroviral DNAs are in uh, these are inserted into the human genome. Uh, Jerry, can we go back to the previous slide that we skipped over? Thank you. Now, the way that we use ERVs as evidence to back up the fossil records is what we've got there on the screen right now. These are the fossil records um, that, that have existed for a long time. We start off with, obviously, Afarensis right at the bottom, all the way up to Homo sap uh, sapiens at the top. And those coloured dots represent how ERVs are used to back up the fossil record. Now, an ERV insertion, we look right down at the, very, at the one at the very bottom. We've got that little blue dot there. These ERV insertions happen in a one in a 50 million chance location. I want that number to sink in a one in a 50 million chance location. So if I'm infected with a virus and you're infected with the same virus, the chance of, of that uh, integration happening in the same point in our DNA is one in 50 million. But we can pass that insertion on to our offspring. Now, if we have a look at the, the fossils uh, here, we can see where it's marked in blue. And this is obviously a representation of, if you want to see all the exact uh, examples, I've linked a scientific paper that goes through them on the right hand side. So, you know, I'm not just making this up. Um, but we can see that the uh, the blue insertion is at the bottom and that filters through all the organisms, all the all the, uh, the, the different species of human uh, that are there. But when we get to uh, Homo erectus, though, and we get a fresh insertion, a yellow one. We don't see the yellow before, but we see it in all the descendants afterwards, and so on and so on and so on. These insertions in that one in a 50 million chance location. Um, ERVs, a retro, uh, uh, endogenous uh, retroviral DNA, is such a strong piece of evidence for evolution, and it backs up the fossil record, certainly for human evolution. And we share seven of them with our closest ancestor, the the chimp. So I would again love your interpretation of of how that could be, how that could come about by coincidence if it wasn't evolution. Now I've got lots and lots. I can say you can see my PowerPoint is quite thick and full, just like yours. But um, I've gone on for quite some time. And I'm not going to bore everybody. I would really like some responses from you. But what I will also say is we're here to talk about evolution. We're here to talk about animals. We're not here to talk about the evolution of the universe or the Big Bang 
or anything like that. And I'd like to keep the debate purely on evolution of animals. So I'll pass that over to you now. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. All right. So, uh, Kent, so you know the time that you are going to have allotted to you is 16 minutes. Give me one moment and everyone will be able to see your full screen momentarily for your segment of the presentation. And the clock is yours. Oh, I'm not seeing my screen up there. We can see it on the live stream. Everybody else, Everybody can, else see can see it. Everybody but me. Oh, well, okay. Anyway. I can fit yours out. No, that's, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, yes, I, I do believe the Bible is true. I believe the evolution theory is the dumbest religion in the, in the world. Um, and I think I can answer every question that you gave, but there, there's, there's too many. Uh, you know, it's like a shotgun. I'm supposed to stop every one of these BBs. All of them have a simple answer. Uh, we have a science center here in Pensacola. I mean, in uh, Lenox, Alabama, straight north of Pensacola. You can come down and take a tour of the place, and I'll be glad to give you a tour around our science center and everything. The Bible says clearly that God created the world, and that's what I believe is true. And as I always start off my debates, I point out this word evolution has six meanings. You've said you don't want to talk about cosmic evolution, which is the first one, the origin of the universe has to come from the Big Bang, or chemical evolution. That would be a problem, I think, how we get all these different chemicals. Or thirdly, stellar evolution. Well, I will, I will avoid those, but I think I would leave it uh, in the record, Your Honor. This is a major problem for the evolutionist, how to explain how stars and the planets got here. Number four would be the origin of life, which is also a major obstacle right there called organic evolution. I'd like to leave that in the record that, that this has not been answered. None of these have been answered by any evolutionist ever. Number five is what we call um, uh, micro evolution or macro evolution. I think it's a lousy term and microevolution, but we never see any animal change to a different kind of animal, never. No farmer in the history of the world has ever seen any plant or animal produce other than its kind, which is why the atheists and evolutionists always go to the fossil record. I say, first of all, there is no such thing as a fossil record. There are bones in the dirt, lots of them. We have a bunch here in our museum. I got petrified clams right here beside me. There's no question there are lots of fossils, but it's not a record. They don't have a date stamped on them and they don't talk. We're putting our interpretation on them. And the finding them in this order that you talked about is interesting. Let me get, uh, let's see, slide number here. All over the world, we, I live in a gravel pit in Lenox, Alabama, a former gravel pit. It's now an amazing uh, creation science center. But all over the world, gravel is rounded off. And I'd like to answer some of your questions about why, why would uh, the layers be sorted the way they are and the animals in this order. If you put rocks in a rock tumbler, let it run for two weeks and drive your parents crazy while it makes noise night and day, it will round off the gravel into polished rocks, depending on what kind of polisher you put in there. We see layers of strata and rock all over the world. I have a bunch of them right here sitting under my feet. There are seven layers of gravel that they dug out of this gravel pit, 140 acres. These great levels of layers of gravel extend all the way to North Carolina. There are hundreds, maybe even a thousand or more gravel pits in Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida, that are digging from these same seams of gravel that extend all the way. Rocks automatically sort themselves. And you can have two densities of, of material in these little things you flip over and got a, mine's out in the field, but <clears throat> two layers of glass with sand in between. You only have two densities of sand, black and white in this case, you flip it over and it makes 20 layers. In seconds, you can buy them at Walmart for $10. It's called hydrologic sorting. So first of all, the creatures are not sorted in the order they put in the textbooks. I taught earth science also for 15 years. And the sorting, any sorting there is, would just as easily be explained by a flood. I'll show you. Oh, hang on, oh, right here. We have right here layers of gravel, then layers of silt and sand or clay, and then another layer of gravel, uh, pebble or sand. Can you see what they can hear, sir? I cannot hear you. Can you tell me, can they hear us all right? Can you hear me okay? Uh, uh, the audience is saying that you are quiet. You're a so. little bit quiet. Okay, I'll talk into the mic better like this. Turn me up, Jimmy, all the way. <clears throat> your, uh, your slides are right, I'm working on, oh, hang on. How do I do that? Are you seeing, I don't know how to get that one over there. Is it 
Did that do it? See, according to evolution, things get better automatically. I can't get it to work for me though, because I don't believe in it, I guess. I don't know how to get it to change. Well, I can't maximize it, it's changing now. But can you see this here? Hello, Al, can you see this on my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, I do not get it to maximize here. There's my mouse. There, okay. When they dig for coal, they very frequently have multiple layers of coal that they go after. This is a common uh, um, phenomenon. They'll have a layer of coal, then a layer of gravel or sand or clay, another layer of coal. <clears throat> and coal can be formed quickly all over the world, petrified trees. Zoom in on that. Or is it, they're getting our picture, right? My mm -hmm. picture kind of small. Um, double, -click in the picture. double click in the picture. There, okay. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up, connecting all these layers. Now, I know, Al, you're very intent on the idea that the layers are different ages and represent different eons. That is simply not true. When you get petrified trees standing up, connecting all the layers, I think it's more common sense to say these layers formed very rapidly because the petrified the tree would fall over before it could rot. And multiple layers are found frequently. Here's what happened. During the flood in the days of Noah, the moon would pull the tide up like it always does and hold it like a bump of water while we spin around. It would be a tidal change every six hours, high tide, low tide, high tide, low tide, except the moon is also moving, so it ends up six hours, 12 and a half minutes between high tide and low tide. Who cares? Well, if the moon is holding this bump of water up while we spin around under it, during the flood in the days of Noah, there would be nothing to interrupt this tide. Right now, the tide starts building up and it bangs into South America or North America. It gets interrupted. So we cannot get what's called a harmonic tide. But if the earth were completely covered in water, like the Bible says it was, and like there are flood legends, by 330 of them now on creation science, What's the name of that website? Uh, it has all the different flood legends on there. I'll think of it in a minute. But the tide is interrupted. So in Florida, they get about a four-foot tide. In the Bay of Fundy, Canada, they get about a 50-foot tide. But if the earth were not, uh, if the earth were smoother, there's enough water right now on the earth, right now, in the oceans to cover the earth 8,000 feet deep, a mile and a half. So if the earth were completely covered in water, like the Bible says it was, the tide would become harmonic. And the physics all says this will be about a 200-foot tidal change every six hours, 12 and a half minutes. Well, if you have a bump of water coming up right here in Lenox, Alabama, it's gonna come up 200 feet, sit still for an hour, and then go down 200 feet, sit still for an hour, and then come up 200 feet, you're gonna create a problem. At this latitude, we're at 31 degrees north latitude, 31.3366 if you're technical. At this latitude, the radius of the earth, times two times pi, tells us that we have a circle to go around, uh, cosine 31.35, okay, right here. We have 21,264 miles around the Earth at this latitude to spin around in 24 hours, which means at Lenox, Alabama, we're going about 886 miles an hour. Equator's going 1,037, the North Pole's going zero. So if the Earth, if this bump of water has to come up and down within this six hours, 12 and a half minute time frame, the water to fill the bump has to be rushing sideways. There would be times when the rush would, water would be rushing sideways at 800 miles an hour. It would sit still for a while and then leave a layer of sand or silt or clay behind when it sits still and then rush the other way. So you would get water rushing in and out just from the tidal change during Noah's flood every six hours and 12 and a half minutes. So these layers, it would be a tidal surge when it gets to a maximum velocity and then slowly tapers off. Can you start so, bottom right arrow? I don't know what you're talking about. On the bottom right of your- Bottom right, right arrow on the train here? Up, a little bit right there. That Okay, yeah, that's a little better. There. You would get a number of phenomena like turbidity currents. You would get the hydrologic sorting happening because of Noah's flood. Let's see, uh, rock tumbler making rocks round. We have tens of millions of round gravel rocks right here in Lenox, Alabama. Here's a picture of all the gravel pits in Florida, Alabama, Georgia. These pits go all the way to North Carolina, digging from the same layers. And rounded rocks are found all over the world. They were in a giant flood. Now you asked, you mentioned about uh, the Solomon's Sea being a geom geometrically impossible thing to build. Let me get this one over there on top of it, if I can. Press escape. Press escape. Let's see. Uh, 
F for Seth. I don't know. I, it's not showing over here. I don't know what to do about it. Let's see. Hit F. Hit what? F. F. Anyway, Solomon C. I'll just read you the text here. In uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 4, you gave the First Kings reference to this. They're both mentioned in there twice. First Kings 7 and 2 Chronicles 4. Solomon made a molten sea of 10 cubits from brim to brim. A cubit is elbow to fingertip. And it says a line of 30 cubits did compass it about. So you are correct. That is mathematically impossible. Pi is 3.1415963 or 265. And it goes forever. Japanese figured it out for a trillion decimal places. Who cares? But you, read, you missed the part. In 2 Chronicles 4, 5, it says the thickness was a hand breadth. Let me get this one all V, V, 1, double, 44. There. Yeah, okay, got it. Um, it says the thickness was a hand breadth. So it, you're correct, pi times diameter equals a circumference, and it would appear to be a contradiction, 10 cubits across and 30 cubits around, but it's not a contradiction at all because it's a hand breadth thick. So I did a study of about 20 different people and said, how long is your cubit? What's your hand breadth? And do the math. If you take, if, if they're measuring 30 cubits around the inside, which would be the number you would need to calculate the volume of the, of the bowl, the thickness of the brass would not matter to calculate the volume. It could be a mile thick. And the outside would be the di distance you, you would need to go through a doorway to carry this thing through a door. If you take 10 cubits and subtract two hand breadths and divide backwards, you get 3.14159. So it is not a contradiction at all. You are assuming there's a contradiction. I think you're making one up because you want there to be a contradiction. I think I've answered all the supposed Bible contradictions in my, in my seminar series, uh, 50 video number seven, question answer, where I cover just contradictions in the Bible. Now, you mentioned that you thought uh, uh, the rap rapidity, uh, rapid species development, you're using linear progression rather than geometric progression. If two rabbits get off the ark and they have babies and some of them move up where it's cold and some move where it's warm, those with the thicker fur can survive the cold climate better. Nature will select certain ones to survive in a certain environment. Nature doesn't create a thing, it selects. The thick furred rabbits would survive better in cold climates, and the thin furred rabbits would survive better in hot climates. But it didn't create the fur. It just selected something already in the gene code, which was the, some, some have thicker fur than others. Some people have more hair than others. So then you have two different breeding populations. So in the next generation, you could get a total of four possibilities. The next generation would be eight. The next generation would be 16. The math on all of yours is assuming they all had to come in a straight line. You know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and actually it's 2, 4, uh, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. So you're greatly wrong in your mathematics about the speciation number. But I want you to keep in mind, Al, the, this little minor problem you may have thought you pointed out about getting all these varieties of dogs or rabbits or chickens in, in just 40, 400 years. For heaven's sake, Al, you believe all these animals came from a rock. You talk about a problem with speciation. What's the gene code in a rock? Where do you get the ERVs coming out of a rock? And the, you, you guys do believe life had to start from the soup, the prebiotic soup, which came from the rocks. So you're straining at a gnat and swallowing an elephant, son. The, the idea that the, all the rabbits in the world today, I don't know about how many varieties you said there were. I know there are 339 recognized breeds of dogs. I've, I've had a family come to a seminar when I was speaking one time. They said, Mr. Hogan, our family has been in the dog kennel business for 100 years, three generations. Grandpa started it, dad took it over, and I'm running it now. They say, so the guy said, I, I can promise you, we could, in 100 years, create all the breeds of dogs today from just generic mutts. We could selectively breed, and you only get a new generation of dogs every year. You take something smaller, like <clears throat> rabbits breed much faster, you can get several generations per year. Or you take uh, bacteria, where you get a generation every 20 minutes. But you know, in all these millions of generations we've had of bacteria, they're still making baby bacteria. They're not, they're not making any, there are no two-celled animals or three-celled or four-celled. It's not happening. I mean, evolution only takes place, only takes place in the imagination. Evolution is pure SpongeBob religion. That's all it is. Nobody's ever seen any animal or plant produce a different kind. Never. So it's not a problem with the varieties we see today to be produced in a few thousand years coming from Noah's flood. It's not a problem for all those layers to be deposited in one year. And then for all those layers to be eroded away as the flood water rushes off, probably in a matter of months. I would say Grand Canyon probably took two weeks max. Google dam break at Dinosaur Adventure Land, and you'll see the dam that we made wash out in, 11, in seven minutes because we let the water go over the top and it washed it out. 
you can see the Tom Sauk Reservoir that blew it, that blew one side out in St. Louis in 2005. One section, water went over the top. It lost a section of the wall, Tom Sauk, T-A-U-M-S-A-U-K, St. Louis, in 2005. It washed out a section, and 1.5 billion, with a B, billion gallons of water were lost in 10 minutes. And it carved a canyon down the side of the mountain on the St. Louis side. And in 10 minutes, dams break all the time and do enormous erosion. Look what happened to Mount St. Helens when that dam broke, the, the mudslide broke in 2000, 1982. So I think your the Bible says in the last days, the scoffers, when I would put you in that category, are willingly ignorant, and I would put you in that category too, of the creation, how God made the world, and they're ignorant of the flood. God created the animals to produce a wide variety of offspring. It's amazing the varieties you can get in the variations that happen within the same kind. There are now eight varieties of bears in the world, and they might have had a common ancestor called a bear. That does not prove bears are related to mosquitoes and whales and cactus. But you guys strain at this gnat of not being able to calculate how you get all these species. And again, you're doing the math wrong. But you strain at little gnats like that in the thickness of Solomon's Sea and say, oh, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Keep in mind now, we're not asking the Bible to be taught in the public schools. You guys are demanding that your religion be taught at taxpayer expense all over the world. You, the burden of proof's on you, not me. You got to prove that a mosquito and a cactus and a whale are related and had a common ancestor. We're not asking for our theory to be taught. If we were, the burden of proof would be on us. But I take the position that all observation of all of human history says whales produce whales, cows produce cows, cactus produce cactus, no exceptions. 90 you get seconds. Wide seconds. within the kind, but that's all you get is a variation of the same kind. Thank you. Go ahead. On, no, I was saying you still had 90 seconds left. My throat hurts. He can have it. Go ahead. <laughs> all right, then. Well done. Right, let's see if I can get on the right. So what what's what happens now? Now we are going into the uh, the rebuttal phase oh. where you actually get to reply to all that Mr. Hovind has put forth to you. And is there a time limit on this bit? Uh, we are going to go with ten minutes. To... Okay, no, right. I will be quick. Um and then uh yes, I will be as quick as I can. So uh can well we'll just start let me get my powerpoint up uh tell me time's not started yet it has not okie dokie right i'm jotting a load of things down here so the order might be a little bit uh bit off um but let's just go with what we've got okay let's begin uh so first of all just, oh, go on. Oh, time I'm has started feedback. go for it i'm getting uh, i can hear uh we're, we're getting feedback from kent there we go we're all set now Okay, let's go then. Right, so let's just recap with everyone what happened. I asked you very, very specifically at the beginning if you could explain to me, give me examples of any kind of animal that has uh, the rate of speciation that it's got. And you massively dodged that question. You talked about geography. And if we want to talk about geography, we'll talk about how the flood managed to deposit all the kangaroos in Australia, should we? Yeah, and throw the, the polar bears to, to one pole on the earth. Like, you, you completely failed in any way, shape or form to explain or give any examples of that rate of speciation. It was a massive dodge, as was your your uh, response to why we get these layers of uh, rock of different densities. You talked about a child's toy that you flick over. You know, you, you've not provided anything of any scientific basis. There. And what I'm after is an honest debate where you can give me some scientific explanation, not an analogy about flicking a toy, you know, not not a, a made up explanation of the water spinning around the earth and maybe it could drop some sediment, which is what I've got. Maybe the water can drop some sediment and maybe it'll drop a bit more later on. Um, show me where we see anything like that in the real world. You haven't. You've completely left me unsatisfied and let myself uh, uh, not let yourself down on that one. Sorry. OK, um, let's have a look at slide seven of mine, Jared, please. Because uh, we also talk you wanted to talk about. Uh, the polystrate fossil. I'm not sure if I can see my slide on your screen. What do I uh, need to click on? Uh, uh, not yet. Actually, give me a moment to bring that back up for you. Didn't know you wanted to oh, sorry, go back yeah. to that. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. Uh, I'm going to go back to a few of these. Sorry, mate. We're we right to pause the timer while this... Uh... Yep, we are good. We are... All right, which slide number? One that's labeled seven, it will be, I'm not sure where it is now because they're all mixed. Um, 
If you go down, 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 and Found it's it. there, it's a got it, yeah. You show me a picture of a tree growing through, uh, you know, some layers of, of rock. This is a book from the 1900s uh, that details exactly how these uh, polystrate fossils are, are, are made. John William Dawson, look it up. The, the, the science behind this has been known for a long period of time. Most of them uh, are formed um, in swamp-like areas and rapid deposits of sediment in swamp-like areas that give you the the, um, the the picture you were showing me before. There is no explanation for how these are formed in areas that haven't been swamp-like in the past. This is well documented. If you can show me a very specific polystrate fossil like that, growing through absolutely solid rock that has never been, you know, that's like never been in any, any kind of swampy area whatsoever, then I'd love to look at it. But polystrate fossils are absolutely well and truly understood. Um, let's look on to the next one. The tides. Well, I think we've touched on that. Uh, you know, basically, when I asked, uh, when you were talking about the tides, you basically just said, what if some water sloshed around on the earth and maybe dropped some sediment? I'm not giving that any time. It was a load of nonsense. Um, the circle. You talk about the, the circle not being able to calculate pi correctly. You know, you told me there was no contradiction in the Bible with that. So what I'm going to take from that is that the Bible gives very unclear instructions. There was nowhere in that verse where the Bible said you're using the thickness of your hand to do that. There was nothing in that. verse. It was essentially an extremely unclear instruction. And maybe that's a byproduct of nobody having the original Bible. Nobody's got it. Nobody's got the second version, the third version. What we are reading and have been reading for centuries is you know, the 100th, 200, 300, 400, 5,000th translation and version of that book that has been cobbled together. That's why it's unclear. And that's why we cannot take it literally like you're taking it. Now, you did use the comment before that um, kind will bring, you know, kind uh, animals of the same kind can bring forth and no animal has ever um, produce something that's not its own kind. So I'm going to take from that that you mean no animal has ever brought forth another animal that cannot breed with it with uh, cannot breed with its own kind. If you like, let's let's just skip to slide twenty, Jared. Is that okay? It's number thirty on there. So we're going down now. This is the Greenish warbler. I'm sure you're aware of that. It's an example of a ring species, and this isn't just one on its own. If you skip to slide thirty-one, just and then hop back. You can see the, there's absolutely dozens and dozens and dozens of ring species examples on the, on the planet. If you can go back up again, please. So a ring species will start with an original population, which you can see on the screen. Now, with the uh, Greenwich Warbler, uh, they were around the um, uh, Tibetan Plateau. And that population, it split. Some of them went uh, one direction around it. Others went another direction around it. And as they went around it, speciation started to occur. But those populations that were living next to each other weren't far enough separated so they couldn't breed. They could still breed. They were still the same kind as you have defined it here tonight because they could still breed. However, once these populations had got around to the other side of the plateau, now they could no longer breed. And by your very definition that you have given us tonight, they can no longer be the same kind because they can't bring forth. They can't breed. Ring species are very, very clear examples. Here we've got A will breed with B, B will breed with C, C will breed with D, but D and A have got absolutely no chance of breeding with each other because they are not the same kind. This is a prediction of evolution. It is not a prediction of creationism. I'll tell you what is a prediction of our current scientific model. The layers and the fossils in the place that we find them and see them now. That is not a prediction of creationism. You've had to ad hoc an argument about chucking water and hoping the sediment falls in the right way. This is a prediction of evolution. Now, what else have we got? Um, okay. Genetic testing. One thing I want to uh, ask you now, because you didn't touch the ERV, you, you completely left the genetics alone. You wouldn't go anywhere near it. So I just want a question. I'm hoping you can give me a yes or no answer. Do you believe that parental testing, parental genetic testing works? Yes or no? Actually, the answer now during your time? Yeah, just, just a yes or no will do. Oh, yeah, yes. I think it works most of the time. Yes, sir. Okay. So... The chances are, when we look at parental testing, 
Um, we use genetic markers and you use about 12 genetic markers in a typical parental test. Um, and the chance of two people having those same markers, if they are not related, if they are not father and son, is one in 50,000. If we use 24 markers, it's one in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands. I gave you an example with these ERVs, these insertions, that are a one in a 50 million chance that they will be in the same place. And we can trace these ERV insertions all the way through uh, from old humans to, to modern humans as we see them now. And as we trace them through, those long terminal repeats, the, those repeating sequences on either side of those ERVs, they start to demonstrate a bit of drift, a bit of change. Because as we, as we come further and further towards the present and mutations affect those long terminal repeats, they become more and more dissimilar or more similar as we go in the past. This was massively strong evidence. You didn't touch it. You didn't want to touch it. You completely dodged it. I really, really would like to hear you talk about the genetics and try and fl uh, you know floor that argument. I'm also going to bring up isochron dating because we didn't have the chance before, but I'm going to do it now in whatever time I've got left. Can you just skip up? How long have I got left, Jared? 90 seconds. Right. Can you just find the isochron dating slide very, very quickly? It's a graph. There we go. You just click on that. Now, I want to go into this a lot more, and if you're willing, we'll have the debate on it. But essentially, radioactive dating proves that these layers of rock and proves that these fossils are way older than 6,000 years. Way, way older. Now, a criticism you will have is that contamination can occur, and that can affect the date that we get. If you understand isochron dating, you will understand that isochron dating will show us whether a system has been closed to contamination or not. And I'm more than happy to get into this in the Q&A afterwards if someone wants to ask me. If you know about isochron dating, you know that you can't argue contamination uh, uh, gives a, a flaw in the date that they give. Um, and I think that's probably my time up. Um, so 30 seconds. please be scientific. Oh, still at 30 seconds left, but... Oh, still at 30 seconds, yep. right. What else can I talk about um, that I had written down? Um, yeah, you st I, I want to go back to the speciation as well. You, you just haven't touched it. The, the amount of new species we, we should be seeing um, on, a, on a weekly basis, you just simply refused to answer. You might think you answered it, but you just refused to answer it. And you said, well, maybe they were all created in different places a long time ago. That was your answer. All right. Give me something solid. Give me something scientific. Show me that creation is backed by science, because so far, you haven't shown anything like that. And time. All right. Let me get this set. Oh, look at that. You decided to take priority there, Marvel. <laughs> oh. It's okay. We'll right. go ahead and do it this way and let Kent have the floor for his entire rebuttal. And 10 minutes starts when you begin. Okay, well, thank you so much. I think you can see why, and when I do debates, I ask very specifically that we talk about one topic at a time. What uh, Al has done here each time he has spoken is thrown out 15 topics and then gets upset when I don't have time to answer one or two of them. This is typical. But now, next time we do a debate, which is your favorite topic? You pick the top one. Tell you what, you give me the best three lines of evidence for evolution. Send it to me. You get prepared to defend it. I'll get prepared to rebut it. And we'll talk about one topic at a time because I cannot cover all this. And then you're going to think you won because I didn't get a chance to answer all of them. All of them can be answered very easily. And I do in my seminar, which you can see on our website, drdino.com. So I'm going to try to take as many as I can in my 10 minutes allotted. And if I don't get the other ones, it's not because I'm afraid of them. It's because there isn't time, okay? You brought up too many things. Now, how did the kangaroos get to Australia? After the flood, the ark landed in the country Turkey today, and the animals began to spread out. Kangaroos are less aggressive than tigers, so they would probably be driven to the migration, to the fringe of the migration wave. And animals since the flood are not leaving fossils behind. Animals die today by the millions and they don't turn to fossils. Nearly all of the fossils we find period in the world would have happened because they were buried rapidly. So if the ice caps were larger 
and the oceans were lower, which would be the two things would happen automatically together. If you made the ice caps larger, the oceans would be smaller and lower. If you lower the oceans just a few hundred feet, you can look Google map and zoom in on the satellite view of any area. Look at England, between England and France, that water is only 150 feet deep, the English Channel, 30 miles wide and 150 feet deep from here to the tree over there. So by lowering the oceans 200 feet, let's say, or 300 feet, everything becomes connected. Australia becomes part of Vietnam. All this is one giant peninsula. So the kangaroos could have easily migrated over, the, over a few hundred years. Several things are happening at the same time. They're fleeing from the more aggressive predators, tigers and lions, and that's not safe to have their babies in that neighborhood. So over many generations, they slowly migrate this way. At the same time, the ice caps are melting back and the water level's coming up. That's why we have a continental shelf. There are two parts to the ocean, the abyss, 12,000 foot deep average, and the continental shelf starting at about 300 feet. Well, 300 out of 12,000 is pretty small. But if you lowered the oceans 300 feet, made the ice caps bigger, both would happen simultaneously, you could walk anywhere in the world. The land bridge between Russia and Alaska would be about 1,000 miles wide, just by lowering the ocean about 300 feet. Between Alaska and Russia today, it's only about 60 feet deep. So Florida would be ginormous. You could probably walk over to Cuba and the Bahama Islands, or, uh, uh, Bahamas, just by lowering the ocean. So I believe the kangaroos probably migrated, happened to go that direction, ended up trapped in Australia, protected, where they could develop into 20 different kangaroo varieties, but they're still kangaroo. And so that would have happened after the flood. Let's see, speciation. You said, I failed to explain the rate. You must not have heard me, son. I said, you're doing it linear mathematics, arithmetic, instead of geometry, doing it multiplication. If you have rabbits produce babies that go to two climates, now you have two populations spreading out. And you can go from 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32 to 64. You're wanting to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You're doing it with a linear instead of logarithmic. So I did answer the question. Don't say I didn't. Answered it very carefully. Plus, you did not answer my question. You're saying there's a problem with getting all these varieties of rabbits from two rabbits. Son, you believe all the rabbits came from a rock. You do. <laughs> That's what the textbooks teach. I show this over and over. It rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive. And somehow, in that first single-celled life form, it learned to be multicellular and turned to rabbits and whales and mosquitoes. That's got to be the dumbest theory in the history of humanity. Let me try to get a few more here. As far as isochron dating and, and uh, radiometric dating, we just have a whole separate debate on that. Same thing on your ERVs. Again, that would take a long time. Let's have a whole separate debate. I think those can all be easily answered, but not in the 10 minutes allotted here. Let me pick some of the main ones I've got. You mentioned ring species. This happened with the Kaibab squirrel and the Abert squirrel around the Grand Canyon. I agree. As, as animals diversify, like the warblers you mentioned, they went around a lake uh, or plateau, and now they can no longer interbreed. Are they still a warbler? Are they still a bird? Is that enough evidence for you, the fact that we have two varieties of warbler that do, do not normally interbreed? Maybe they could be forced to interbreed. I don't know. But they don't normally interbreed with each other. And you think that's enough evidence to believe warblers and, are related to cactus and mosquito? You think that process could go on and, and change the warbler to, a, to anything other than a warbler? Same thing with the ring species of any of the ring species examples you guys want to give, uh, whether it be the squirrels, the Abert squirrel or the Kaibab squirrel in the Grand Canyon or others. But so the fact that they can no longer interbreed does not prove they did not come from an original ancestor. There are eight varieties of bears that don't normally breed together, but they came from an, they originally could, and it's still a bear. A five-year-old can tell you it's still a bear. Mackenzie is five. She can tell you, she can look at both of those and say, that's still a bird, Mr. Holman. That's still a bird. Yeah. And you're going to say those two varieties of warbler is evidence for evolution when it's not. It's evidence of variation within the same kind. They're still a bird, bird. As far as animals sorting by density, here's this little thing we have at Dinosaur Adventure Land. There are four different densities of sand in this one, uh, black, dark blue, light blue, and white. These four different densities, every time you flip this thing over, will form 20 or 30 or 40 or sometimes 100 layers because water automatically sorts things by density, but not strict density. It has, there's a lot of factors involved in, in sorting. You can buy these at Walmart in our country for 10 bucks. So the sorting would happen. Clams are generally found at the bottom of the so-called geologic column. There is no geologic column, by the way. There's a bunch of layers of rock, which all formed during Noah's flood. You guys would love to say, well, the top layer is younger than the bottom layer. I say, really? Where'd the top layer come from? Outer space? 
none of the layers are different ages. They're all, they're all on the earth at the same time. All of them, they got reshuffled during the flood. Petrified trees in the standing position. You said they came in a swamp. This is absolutely ludicrous. This is not true. There are thousands of petrified trees that have been found standing up, connecting all these different layers. Here's me by one in Yellowstone. Yellowstone has a whole forest of them standing up, petrified tree in the vertical position. A friend of mine in North Alabama is a, a manager of a coal mine there. Let me get the pictures here. Petrified tree standing up. There's a coal mine right up here in central North Alabama. There is my friend, uh, Mr. McDonald. They have layers, they have trees. They're digging the coal out of there, mining it. He said, can't we find them all the time? Like petrified trees standing up, coming from one seam of coal through layers of rock through the next seam of coal. He sent me the sample. He said, we get sample A, B, C, D. We have the Blue Creek Formation, the Mary Lee Formation. And he said, you can put together sample A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And I can prove to you very clearly that those layers of coal had to form at the same time or within a few months of each other because tree A comes out of seam out of the Blue Creek Formation and goes to here. This tree starts in a layer below this and goes up through the Mary Lee. You guys like to say these coal seams have to form, a forest has to grow, has to get compressed into coal, new layers deposited on top for millions of years, and then another forest grows and it gets compressed to coal. And yet there are 27 consecutive layers of, of seams of, in uh, Yellowstone with trees, petrified trees standing up, penetrating all of them. Here's one tree, a 30 foot petrified tree, going through a seam of coal at the bottom, bunch of rock, and then a seam of coal at the top. This is in Tennessee. These are found all over the world. And you guys just cannot give up on the idea that your geologic column is dumb. It doesn't exist. We just made in four minutes, uh, probably 40 layers right here in front of this, in front of you, out of four different densities of sand. So I don't think you have a cl clear grasp of how hydrologic sorting works. Here's a petrified tree in Tennessee. I was just up there two days ago. I didn't get to go see them, but I was in the area where they find these all over the place. Petrified trees standing up. These are not growing in swamps. Goggins, Nova Scotia has hundreds of these trees growing through multiple layers of rock. There's one right here, Goggins, Nova Scotia, all along the beach. They find here's a part of it, the rest fell out of the middle. Petrified trees in the standing position. So whoever told you they're growing out of swamps lied to you. That is not true. And these layers of rock had to form rapidly, and layers can form rapidly. We show that very clearly with a little toy here you can buy at Walmart for 10 bucks. Come visit our science center at Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. And we'll show you all kinds of cool science experiments that will document if the flood story is correct. But in Joggins, Nova Scotia, they show the tree penetrating all these layers and put a sign up that this is 300 million years old from the Carboniferous era, which is absolute pure propaganda. That is not true. These layers had to form rapidly. Seconds. What did I not get to? You're going to say, you're going to pick one I didn't answer here. They're no longer the same kind you mentioned. Uh, excuse me. Al. The warblers on opposite sides, the ring species, are still the same kind. They're still a bird. They're still a warbler. Give me an example where this ring species example you're talking about can change it to what anybody, would, what a five-year-old would consider a different kind. Petrified tree standing up. I've got enough stuff to go forever on this. Okay. Uh, let's see. My time up. How much time do I have? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. That's what I thought. Okay. As far as carbon dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium, lead 208, lead 206, anyone you want to pick, let's do a separate debate on that. But any dating method is based on the obvious assumption that you know the initial content. You can't possibly know that. You know it's never been contaminated. You can't possibly know that. You know there's no way to speed up or slow down the decay rate, which we know can easily, under heat and pressure, the decay rates can be changed radically. They've taken potassium to argon, which takes 1.3 billion years, under heat and pressure, done it in four seconds. I think you're grossly mistaken about all that, but go ahead. All right. All right. Okay. Jared, <clears throat> so, Jared the links. Yep. And before we uh, continue back with the open discussion, the uh, back and forth portion of this, we do have the links at uh, where are they currently located, Marvel? In the chat. Um, both are being uh, shilled out by our mods, our lovely mods. Thank you. Our amazing, wonderful moderators. <laughs> They're great. That they are, which it is to benefit, for those who are unaware, the Bacon God, otherwise known as they and them, TNT, the wonderful purveyor of cured meat. <laughs> and because of the movement, let me go ahead and get 
that back set up. There we go. All right, now that we have back and forth. The, we have the back and forth, which feel free to answer each other's questions more directly at this point, and we will also be interjecting a couple questions that we noticed that came up from the live chat at the same time as well. Cool. Can, can I can I start? Is that okay? Or Ken, do you want to do, do, oh, go, go for it? Oh, cheers. Right. Um, I would like one of my slides up again. Can we get that graph up again, Jared, from before? Just wanting to have fun there, cats, huh? Sorry, man. <laughs> bit. Sorry, buddy. So, I mean, Kent, you said a lot in, in this is obviously the Q&A, the back and forth. So I'm not going to address everything you've said. Um, but I will in a video following this debate, um, which, you know, you can you can have a go at debunking on your channel. But I want to talk about um, the radioactive date. And you said you said that you can't possibly know whether something's been contaminated or not. Now, you used to be a science teacher. Right. We're going to go through a little bit of. of science for you now and i want i don't want you just to say that doesn't prove i want you to explain after i've explained what ice condating is i want you to explain to me what the flaw is in it okay so with ice condating so let's take potassium argon you're familiar with that i've heard you talk about that before yeah yes sir and we both know that the potassium decays into argon if more of the parent um uh parent isotope contaminates the sample that's going to affect the age it's going to make it look younger and if more of the daughter isotope uh contaminates sample it's going to make it look older we're happy with that yeah assuming yep. uh, again assuming you know the initial content assuming you know the rate has not changed and cannot be affected by anything and assuming there's no contamination you still have the same built-in assumptions but yes go ahead and okay and there we go so there are if we if we were to just use potassium argon and we we had no idea what the initial starting points were etc and there are some things that we there are some certain rocks that we can especially with argon being such an uh, an inert you know only re reacts under very very certain circumstances you know it, w there are materials that we can but let's look at ice condating if we have a look here these three dots on the graph represent different minerals within a rock this is how ice condating works and what we do in each of those minerals is you can see I've put on the graph, we look at two different ratios, right? If we have potassium and argon, we know that the isotope of argon that is produced by the radioactive decay of potassium is different to the most common isotope of argon, all right? I'm sure you'll accept that. You're not, that's not open for, for debate. I'm sure you'll accept that the isotope of argon produced by decay is different to the, the stable isotope. So what that tells us is we can look at two ratios. If you look at the graph here on the y-axis, we can look at the ratio of the daughter isotope as it's being produced. So the daughter isotope as it's produced by the potassium decay. And we can look at the ratio of that against the isotope, the stable isotope, if you like, that would have been in the rock in the first place. Now, it doesn't matter how much of that there is because we're just looking at uh, a ratio at the second. If we look at that x-axis, we can also look at the ratio of the parent isotope, which is going to be potassium, and the daughter isotope, which is argon. Now, why, why is this relevant? Well, as the potassium decays into argon, let's, and I'm plucking these numbers out my, my backside here, excuse me, but let's say we get 10 grams of argon made in a certain mineral, okay? That's going to affect both ratios in the same way if it's a closed system. The ratio on the y-axis will be changed uh, proportionally to the ratio on the x-axis only if it's a closed system because, do you understand what I'm saying? I do. I understand what you're okay. saying. Yes. So it will. It, now, if we take multiple minerals and we look at the ratio of the daughter isotope as produced by the potassium and the stable version of that isotope, we look at that ratio and then we look at the, well, it's, you can see it's on the graph there. If we plot every single mineral and those ratios in it, if those minerals produce a straight line, then the can, it's not possible for there to have been any contamination whatsoever. It has to have been a closed system if those lines, uh, if, if those things produce a straight line, regardless of the starting amount, right, regardless of, of anything, it has been a closed system because as one amount of argon has been produced, the other isotope, get, the other ratio gets affected in the same amount. If contamination occurs, they will not produce a straight line. Now, the isochron dating, when we look at the gradient of the graph, the steeper the graph, the older the rock. And we draw our age of the rock 
from the gradient of the line. So this isn't your normal, or let's just have a look at how much potassium there is. Let's have a look at how much argon there is. And maybe there's been some contamination. <clears throat> I want you to tell me where, if, we, if, we, if we're using these and they fall on a straight line, where is the flaw in that? I know you mentioned that the rate of decay can, uh, can sometimes change, but you know, as well as I know, that decay rates only change under spectacular conditions like you might find in a star or something like that. Okay, spectacular conditions. So can you just tell me the flaw that's in this? Oh, are you going to give me equal time to do all that? Uh, Absolutely. Okay. Well, please, address, uh, please address isochron dating and the flaw in it. Is my microphone on? Okay. Uh, on my video number seven, I give a very long answer to that if people would like to watch that. But you need to understand all of these dating methods, all of them, potassium, argon, argon's a gas. It disappears very quickly. Uh, uh, all of these dating methods were really just invented in the last 60 or 70 years. The dating is actually done by the geologic column. Let me get this here, uh, 380. Uh, the geologic column invented in 1830 by Charles Lyell and others who worked on this does not exist anywhere in the world except in the textbooks. It's true there are layers. This guy admitted it back in uh, 2000, 1976, American Journal of Science. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. The first thing they do, if you take a sample in to have it potassium argon dated or carbon dated or any kind of dating method, the first thing they do is ask, where did you find it? Like, what difference does that make where I found it? Well, they have to know what strata it came out of so they can bracket the date so they know if the answer they're getting is too high or too low based on the geologic column. Apart from, let's see, ever since William Smith at the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been and still are the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks in which they appear. Apart from very modern examples, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. Interesting. Most of our Earth's atmosphere is within about 10 miles of the surface of the Earth. I think most people would agree with that. 99% of the air is within that 10 miles. And it contains a variety of gases, mostly nitrogen, 78%, 21% oxygen, a little bit of carbon. And we can go through carbon dating, but you didn't want to do that one. You want to do potassium argon. If you walked into a room and found a candle burning on a table and I asked you the simple question, when was it lit? You say, I don't know. Well, let's do some empirical science. This is an analogy. We find a fossil that has some potassium, has some argon. We can tell exactly how many molecules of each. No question. When was it lit? Well, we can measure the height of the candle and say that candle is seven inches tall. We can also measure the rate of burn and say it's burning an inch an hour. Now, when was it lit? Well, I don't know. We still have to make some assumptions. How tall was it? Has it always burned at the same rate? Those are two things we could not possibly prove. When, it come, when you find a fossil in the dirt in the so-called geologic column, you can measure the amount of potassium or argon or carbon-14 or anything you want, but that's all you can determine. The rate, it's, the rate it's currently decaying at and how much is currently in it. It's in a court of law, none of those dates would hold up in an honest court of law. None of them would hold up. Let me get the potassium argon 449 here, 449. Um, radiometric, radioactive dating failure. There's thousands of examples where it has absolutely failed, where they get the wrong dates. Potassium decays to argon in 1.3 billion years. Planetary Sciences Abstract, 48th annual meeting, back uh, whatever the date on that was, as much as 80% of the potassium in a small sample of iron meteorite can be removed by distilled water in four and a half hours. So you put the meteorite in distilled water in four and a half hours, half the potassium is gone. Well, that's going to greatly throw off your date. Because again, like I said, you cannot prove the initial content, nor that the decay rate has remained constant. Here's Canadian Journal of Earth Science. <clears throat> in conventional interpretation of potassium argon age data, it's common to disregard, to discard ages, which are substantially too high or too low compared to the rest of the group or with other available data, such as the geologic column. The KBS Tuft, K. Brinsenmeyer Tuft, a layer of ash named for K. Brinsenmeyer, was dated using potassium argon dating. This is from Nature Magazine back 40 years ago, and also mentioned in National Pornographic back in 18, 1985. They took a skull that they found, KNMR uh, 1470, it was found in 1972 by Richard Leakey in the, in the KBS Tuft. It looked like modern humans, but they gave it a date of 2.9 million years. Why? Because of the geologic column. 
Later, they took 10 samples of uh, tough and uh, material from this KBS tough, and it, it got numbers from 0.5 to 2.6 million years. Well, that's way down from 212, where it should have been. But even that is a 500% error. Is it 0.5 or 2.6? So my point would be, if they get radical numbers, it is not an exact science like you're trying to portray to your listeners. George Buffon said the Earth is 70 million years old. That was back in 1770. In 1905, you can look up the old magazines. They'll say, oh, the Earth is 2 billion years old. When they went to the moon in 1969, all the newspapers said the Earth is 3.5 billion years old. I was a teenager when that happened. It's three and a half billion years, the age of the Earth. Today, they're telling the students it's 4.6. The Earth is getting older at 21 million years per year. That's 40 years per minute. You talk about your speciation. So wild dates are obtained. Potassium argon from Mount Etna in Sicily erupted in 122 BC, gave a potassium argon age of 250 million years. Excuse me, it's 2000. It's wrong. Lava from Mount Saint, or from the Hawaiian volcano erupted in 1801. The potassium argon, which is usually used on lava or tuff or something, uh, or t something came out of a volcano, it erupted in 1801, but it gave a date of 1.6 million years. This is from Earth, Earth and Planetary Science. Huh. Lava, that's 1968. Is it getting better? 1999, they took lava from uh, Mount Kiloa, Kileoia, Iki in Hawaii, erupted in 1959. Gave a potassium argon age of eight and a half million years. It's wrong. It didn't work. There are too many variables. Basalt from Mount Etna in Sicily, 1964. It erupted, gave a potassium argon age of 700,000 years. It erupted again in 1972, gave an age of 350 years. Mount St. Helens erupted. We saw it happen in 1980, and it gave ages anywhere from 350,000 to 2.8 million. Five different laboratories dated it. So when you consider potassium argon dating, a rock of known age doesn't work. It doesn't work when you know the age. If you take a rock of unknown age, it is assumed to work. This is hocus pocus, SpongeBob fairy tale, imagination stuff. I'm sorry, Al, you're wrong. Potassium argon age doesn't work, okay? Wild dates are obtained all the time. Potassium leaks out of the system easily. So does argon leak out easily. It's a gas, it leaks out very easily. Dates that don't fit the evolution theory are rejected and not published. That's what happens. It's based on the assumptions that the original content can be known, that the decay rate never changes, that the sample's never been contaminated. I'm sorry, it's not something anybody would put real science in. There's a good book by Larry Vardaman and some scientists who talk about creationists who talk about radioisotopes and the great problems they have at icr.org. So they do a whole section on isochron dating. I'd, I'd recommend you go there. All right, plenty of time. Next question. OK, right. Well, I'm, I'm going to stick with that one because uh, I can't begin to tell you how disappointed I am with your answer with that. So I'm going to address the question again because I'm not going to let you dodge it and get around it because you didn't answer the question. The question was very specific. Jared, can we get that graph back on the screen again, please, if that's OK, sir? The question was very specific. I asked you if you understood the significance of those three minerals plotting a straight line on the graph. You said you did. And then you started to talk about anything but isochron dating. Now, let's just address the, the radioactive dating that give false uh, readings that you suggested. There's, a, there's a, an error of about 3 million years with potassium argon dating. So if something is aged at 750,000 years old, and really it's only a couple of hundred years old, et cetera, that's within the error. And we don't, we don't use potassium argon dating for things that are that young because of that reason. We don't take those... Uh, reading seriously so you can use them but they're with they're, they are within the area it stands something called iron drift and I'll, I'll be honest i don't fully understand iron drift but this i do understand and i'm going to highlight this again because you told me you understood the significance and then you showed everybody watching that you totally had no idea what the significance of this was so let's do this again on that y-axis the daughter isotope is going to be the argon on the y-axis the one at the top that is the argon produced as the potassium decays Below that, the one that we're dividing it by, getting the ratio against, is the is the isotope of argon that is already in that uh, mineral when it starts. And we're just looking at a ratio. On the x-axis, we have the potassium on the top, and we have the argon that it decays into on the bottom. Now, the important thing is, as the potassium decays, a certain amount of the daughter isotope will be made, and that will affect both ratios in the same way 
as long as the system is closed. If the system is not closed, we will never get a straight line on this graph. The system has to be closed. You're a clever guy. You're a scientist. You've been a science teacher. You must understand that we would only get a straight line across all these minerals if, if that was a closed system. The production of the daughter isotope of argon is going to affect both ratios in the same way unless it's not a closed system, in which case we don't get a straight line. And we do not use isochron date and we do not take the results seriously. We don't go any further if they do not produce a straight line. Do you understand the significance of the line being straight? Because I think that's the problem because you started talking about carbon dating before when I asked you that and you dodged this question and we're going to have an honest debate and I, I, I'll answer any question you want. I won't dodge it, but can we make this a standing point that you are either going to be honest and say you don't know or you're going to explain to me the significance of it? And I'll do that to any question you want to ask me as well. I'll be honest and say I don't know or I'll explain it to you, but please don't dodge the question like you've been doing for, for a lot of the night, to be honest. Please stick to this point and explain to me that you understand the significance of this being a straight line and why, if it is a straight line, we cannot take it seriously. I, no, I do not understand how that can possibly be used to, to demonstrate something that's billions of years old. What do these lines on this paper represent? Is this a percentage of the ratio of uh, potassium to argon? Is it a time scale factor? What is the decay rate of potassium to argon? Again, how do you know it's been a closed system for 1.3 billion years? How could you possibly know that? Which is so why the, I want you to answer the question. You cannot tell it's never been contaminated. You cannot tell it's, an, it's a closed system. Yeah, yeah, we can. And that's because we understand the significance of, of ratios. When the rock is formed, we, we reset the starting clock, if you like, when the rock is formed. You know, you, you, you understand that. Um, yeah, so when, when the rock is formed, there will be some argon that hasn't been produced by potassium decay in the rock, right? There'll be argon that has existed there before. There will be some argon being produced by the decay of potassium. Now, as that ratio of potassium and its own daughter isotope changes, because we're creating that, that daughter isotope, that daughter argon, therefore, the ratio of the argon produced by potassium and the other isotope of argon that was there to start with will change in the same way. So, for example, if I if I lose ten gram, if I if I lose ten grams of potassium or produce ten grams of argon from potassium decay, then that ten grams is going to affect the the other ratio by the same amount. All right, they're going to be proportional. They will not be proportional. They will not show a straight line if there has been contamination. Now, if you if you're saying you don't understand this, you don't understand what this means. That's fine. We can talk about this another time, but just be honest and say you don't understand isochron dating if you've never done it before. Because you know, I'm not expecting you to be an expert on everything. If you've never done isochron dating before, just tell me you've never done it and you don't know it, and we'll move on. That's not a problem. But if you're saying that it's false, if you're saying that it's false and it's flawed, I'm going to push you, and I'm going to push you, I'm going to push you on it to explain why. So it's your call. You can either tell me you don't understand it or, you, or we can go further. Yeah, I do not see the significance of this at all. I showed you clearly from samples that are taken from freshly formed rock, which you said it works on. It re I agree it resets the clock, but you said there's still some argon in it. I showed you lava flows from recent, in the last 2,000 years, were dated grossly wrong using potassium argon dating. What happened to your system? Why didn't it work on the basalt from Mount Etna or the basalt from Hawaii? The Hawaiian volcanoes. Why didn't it work? Why would it get eight and a half million years on lava that is 60 years old? It doesn't work. I the don't know all the reason the straight lines you draw on the graph, it doesn't work in reality. You're the reason Ken, that, that not every rock, so let me, maybe I, I should have explained it this way. Not every rock is a closed system. So we, we know that the ones that are not a closed system we can't trust to give an accurate date. So when you're talking about all these other rocks that have give really uh, inaccurate dates, they have not been closed systems. They haven't been. And if you if you don't test to see the system is closed first, you are going to get an inaccurate result, which is where your results have come from. Isochron dating proves it's a closed system. Now, let me give you an analogy. I'll give you an analogy here, okay? Let's say that um, I have a bag of sweets. I've got some blue ones, I've got some red ones, and I've got some green ones, okay? 
Now, I can do, uh, I'm struggling to think where I'm going to go with this analogy. I might regret this, right? In fact, stuff that analogy, I'll not get there. Let's talk about the isotopes again. Um, I'll edit that out as a blooper. Right, let's talk about the rage because you're still, you're still saying this doesn't work, and I want you to explain why. This proves a closed system because as the daughter isotope of argon is produced, so in other words, there's less potassium and more daughter isotope of argon, by exactly the same proportion, the other ratio is going to change if it's a closed system. Now, you've said that argon is a gas and it can escape, things can leak in. If that happens, when we plot these ratios of all the minerals in a rock, we are not going to get a straight line. Now, I'm just going to ask again, like, because I don't, I'm not here to try and make you look silly. So if you don't, if you just don't understand what isochron dating is, we can talk about this in another debate. But if you're going to continue to tell me it's wrong, I'm going to continue to ask you for an explanation of why it's wrong. And that explanation can't be potassium might leak out or argon might leak out because you have to tell me why this is not proof of a closed system. So can you tell me is this why this is not proof of a closed system or not? Is, is this your field of expertise on isochron dating? Is that, is that is that what you're good at? I thought the debate no, was supposed we, to be on this motion. We just to keep it cool. I think you're obviously frantic that if we could take away time, that evolution can't happen. That's one simple way to deflate your balloon, poke a hole in it. You can't have billions of years. And so it, it, let's do the potential, let's do the isochron dating. I'll get more prepared for that. I, I thought this debate was supposed to be on evolution, no. and you haven't given any evidence of how an animal can evolve to a different kind of animal. Isochron dating has nothing well, to do with it. Time out. That doesn't the possibility. Time out, Ken. Yeah, well. I'm, I'm sorry. Ken, I'm sorry. I have to uh, redirect uh, your statement there of uh, cats not providing anything for evolution. Uh, did we miss the part about the genetic argument that was in his presentation? No, I, I think I answered that clearly, but I'm pointing out that he's diverting greatly away from the topic of evolution to get on isochron dating, which would not have anything to do with evolution. All this does is attempt to preserve the idea that maybe there's billions of years to work with. If without the billions of years, of course, the whole evolution theory collapses in a heap. That's one of many ways to deflate the balloon. So I think we should get back on the topic of what is the evidence for evolution? That was the title of the debate, as I understood it. Isochron dating has nothing to do with that. So what is, what is the evidence for, and I will get more prepared for isochron dating if you'd like, but yeah. I still will stick by the examples we show it doesn't work. And I'll, I'll get, let's do that in another debate. But what's the evidence? What's your best evidence for evolution? Why do well, you we'll, think a mosquito and a whale and a cactus are related? Why would you think such a thing? We'll definitely get to that. I'll just close out on that ice cream. You know, I'm not trying to catch you off guard with stuff like that. And, and I understand if you don't understand it, which is fine. I said at the beginning of this debate that we were going to look at both sides. I opened up with that. I said, that, you know, I'm not going to sit and just try and defend evolution against someone who doesn't believe it. We're going to look at both sides and see which side fits scientifically better. Um, and this comes in to debunking your side. But we'll have a chat about that. You've accepted that you don't understand ice cream dating. And we'll take that for another point. But I'm just going to say now it is proof of a closed system and it, it is proof that the dating can be trusted. Now, in terms of my best evidence for evolution, I think we've talked about the following. We have talked about the layers of the rock that are in, um, again, going back to radioactive debt, you know, we can date the rock. We know they're going back uh, in history way past uh, 6,000 years. We look at the fossils within the rock. We look at the genetics um, and how things like uh, transposons, things like pseudogenes, things like ubiquitous genes, things like ERV, how they all map from the, you know, uh, from the, the fossils right at the very top, as we dig deeper and deeper and deeper down that tree that, that we put together, we know that the genetics holds it together perfectly, all right? So we know that genetic analysis is really important, but you wouldn't address the genetics. You, you just skipped over that and you wouldn't talk about it, which is why I went on to other stuff. So if you want my best evidence, we've got the fossil record backed up by fantastic genetic analysis. So... Should we talk about ERVs or ubiquitous genes? Do you want to talk about, about maybe debunking ERVs? If, if you want to keep it on genetic. But I haven't heard any evidence for creation at all. I've heard some maybe the water might slosh around arguments. Maybe the tigers chase the kangaroos. You know, I've heard that. 
Maybe maybe the kangaroos are scared of tigers. So give me some right. science, right? Let, let's give them the opportunity to respond. Kent, would you like to do a, a brief response about the genetic evidence that cats did begin to touch on? Well, I would certainly point out that if there are genetic similarities between different creatures, that is an example of a common designer. I think all the Microsoft Word programs, I bet Microsoft PowerPoint has thousands of identical lines of code to Microsoft Word because the same guys are writing the code. I bet if I go to Microsoft PowerPoint and click spell check on a word, it takes me to the exact same dictionary as if I'm typing in Microsoft Word. That's not evidence they both evolved from Morse code. It's evidence the same guys are designing it. So if there are similar genes in different animals, I think that's an example of the same designer wrote the code. To make these animals, these animals are unbelievably complex. A flea is more complex than the space shuttle. And so the most complex thing ever, the, a, a single flea is more complex than the entire city of Manchester, England, where you live. All the infrastructure, the water structure, the electrical structure, the sewer system, the street system, everything. None of that, that pales in comparison to a flea in a complexity of every, a single cell is more complex than the whole country of England. So, and yet you want, you want me to believe that because there are ERVs that look like they have similar thing, or there's a genetic code that looks similar, therefore, this is indication of evolution? No, this is indication of an amazingly smart designer, and he ought to get the glory for his creation. The reason clams are found at the bottom of the geologic column is clams are already at the bottom when the flood starts. That's where they live. I think the animals are sorted in the so-called geologic column based upon habitat. The birds are found on top because birds die last in a flood. They're sorted based upon mobility. Clams can't run very fast. They're sorted based upon intelligence. Clams aren't too bright. They're sorted based on body density. A clam, pound for pound or grams per cubic centimeter, is more dense than a bird, grams per cubic centimeter. So I think the sorting, even look at the body density of reptiles. It is different than the body density of mammals. That would automatically sort them into similar layers just because of their body density. Once they die, they're going to be sorted by density. Buy one of these for 10 bucks for heaven's sake, and you can learn some science about how things sort things by density. So I don't think there's any evidence for evolution. And finding them in some kind of order in a, in a column of rock, when I point out the columns cannot, the ages cannot be, layers cannot be different ages. There's trees connecting them. And even if you find them in certain layers, all that indicates is they died. You couldn't prove they had any children at all. No fossils are going to count in a, in a court of law uh, as evidence for anything, for evolution, other than it died. You can't prove a single fossil found in the textbooks had children that lived. Not a single one could it be proven that had children that lived that were different. Why would you think a fossil in the dirt could do something that no animal today can do? Every animal today produces children that are just like itself, the same, obviously same kind. But yet you think bones in the dirt can do something that animals today can't do. I don't understand why you have such faith in such a dumb theory like that. Well, I'm, I'm not going to be dragged into the, the, the straw man argument that you always use, you know, because everybody knows that evolution and, and you, you've done over 200 debates. You know, you know that evolution doesn't say that, you know, something's going to produce a, like an elephant is going to give birth to a pine tree. You know, you, you know that. So the fact that you're using that argument to me says that you maybe you, you're getting a little bit uh, desperate. But anyway, let's go back to the ERVs because I do think that you've missed, you, you again, you've missed the significance again. So let me just explain. And then you can tell me whether you understand the significance or not, and then we can move on. But we'll do one point at a time, like you said. An ERV isn't just about us having the same four bases that make up our DNA and then saying, well, there you go, we're made up of the same instructions. An ERV is an insertion that can happen in your genetics at any point, at any time. You, you could have uh, uh, an endogenous retrovirus in you now that will give some of its DNA and place it right in yours. And it could place it in one of 50 million places. Now, that happens to be in a cell that produces sperm and you father another child then that child will have that erv see, uh, insertion in exactly that one in a 50 million place now your parents won't have it your grandparents won't have it none of your ancestors will have it but your children from this point forward and your whole lineage from this point forward will have it in that random place it can be inserted at any point now when we look and at uh, humans, for example, and we trace back 
and we go, you know, all the I'm not gonna all the way back to Afrensis or whatever. We're not we're not gonna go through the, the family tree, but when we trace back, we can see the ERV insertions and we can map them against uh we can map them against the fossil records and we see that they match perfectly these one in a 50 million chances and as we start to climb up that tree we can see the point where a new insertion is made and that one in a 50 million place insertion is then passed on to all the offspring after that and then the if the new insertion is made that one in a 50 million chance insertion is passed on to the offspring after that it seems to me that you're kind of hand wave dismissing the significant of it being a one in a 50 million chance place. And you're just saying, oh, it's just made up of ATC and G, uh, Microsoft use zeros and ones. You're not, you're not even showing that you accept it's a significant thing, right? Can you address it properly? Yeah, I think let's do ERV in a separate debate. I'm not prepared for that. I think there's a, several possible answers to that. Uh, I agree that, uh, th but see, this is a change in the code. This is like finding a typographical error in a book that is then repeated for every generation after that. Uh, but I think you're missing the significance of this is so minor to say that this, first of all, you did point out, whether you realize it or not, that this is dependent on the geologic column. Uh, let's say three, four, four. Okay. The textbooks do teach, and I have it right beside me here, hundreds of them, that the humans, and the spiders and the mollusks and the worms have a common ancestor. They draw lines on paper that say we all came from a protista, a protozoa, or some have some other single-celled animal. This is what's being taught to the children, that the whale and the mosquito and the cactus are related. And your evidence for that is because we have inserted DNA code from an ERV, and you're basing this on the geologic column again, that this will somehow means something for when they live. There's the problem. All of the strata were formed at the same time during Noah's flood. The layers are not different ages. All the animals lived at the same time. They died at the same time and, the, and probably got sorted by hydrologic sorting. Animals would automatically be sorted based upon their body density in the flood or based upon how long they lived before they died. Maybe they could flee the flood for a few months. Insects wouldn't be included on Noah's Ark at all. Insects survive just fine on a, on a floating log mass or dead carcasses. They can go any place where there's been a flood. When the water goes down, walk out into the mud and you'll see insects by the bazillions. So no, no, God told Noah to bring onto the ark those in whose nostrils is the breath of life on dry land. Noah didn't bring fish. He didn't bring insects. And the sorting that you're, you're relying on, the, again, relying on this geologic column. And there's the problem. And you're relying on some scientists publishing this in a peer-reviewed magazine that won't publish it if it doesn't match the geologic column. Go to North Korea, find me any articles published in any peer-reviewed journal that say communism doesn't work. See if you can find me one like that. So I think you have a real prejudice against anybody speaks out against the geologic column or against evolution, their stuff doesn't get published. So you can't claim majority opinion or it's in a publisher. I won't buy that for a second. Common sense tells me when I see lava tested from a volcano and it gives a wrong age, why won't they publish that? So, uh, destroys your uh, potassium uh, argon. Yeah. Actually, that goes to a question that did come to mind myself while I was listening to you earlier. Uh, the counter arguments to the uh, radiological dating uh, topic that Katz brought up, your all your examples are a lava event, Kent? That, that's generally what potassium argon dating is used on because that resets the clock, a volcanic eruption in theory, the lava would let the argon gas escape. So it should reset the clock. And I'm, I have to do some more research. Can you really tell the difference between the isotopes of argon that were from decay and not from decay? How many isotopes of argon are there? I don't know. That's why I didn't do research on that. But I'm a little skeptic about his two lines on the paper to say we can tell which, which kind of argon came from where and that there's been no contamination. But again, that wouldn't matter for the evolution debate. All that does is attempt to preserve the billions of years time frame that they need to imagine that evolution well, happened. Well, we don't see any animal changing. Well, Even one in hundred billions of years, we don't see it changing. It doesn't happen. It's not science. Well, I'm I'm curious uh, then, Kent, because if the time is a factor in the argument, one in establishing how long something has been around be part of that argument in totality. If you could establish that a rock has been around for billions of years, uh, that again would be based on some very obvious assumptions. Here, here's a rock. 
How old is it? It's rounded off. It's gravel. I think, I think this is going to tumble around. I, I, I bet it came from Noah's flood. I think you'll find great difficulties in establishing the age of things like this based upon different dating methods. And I showed you examples where it doesn't work. And in a court of law, it takes one example of it not working to throw it out. If there are 30 lines of evidence that said Timmy murdered his neighbor, but he can prove he wasn't in the state at the time it happened, well, that's it. Case closed. He didn't murder the neighbor, whether his DNA found at the scene or not. So uh, one line of evidence that shows this method doesn't work is all that's required, especially since you guys want to require that all of us pay to have that taught to all of the kids. Go start a private school. Okay. And teach, or teach, Ken, teach evolution uh, that is and not work. part of the dis that is not part of the discussion ken we are sticking okay. with the actual okay. facts let's not grandstand so it's two on one here today this is great go uh, ahead no, no no okay no i'm a, i'm actually I'm offering you questions to try question. to further explain yeah. your position i'm actually helping you out in this instance jared just ask the question yeah, please I know. I didn't catch that last part. What's that? I'm going to ask questions now. Yep. Yeah. So we do have a couple questions. And let's actually, where has that? It moved. Uh, we'll actually go to one that actually just uh, recently started to touch upon the subject. Uh, this is for you, Ken. If there was okay. a If there was a flood worldwide, how did freshwater fish live as well as the saltwater fish? Excellent question. Keep in mind, this has nothing to do with evolution, and I'm not requiring my theory to be taught. But I believe during Noah's flood, it was all fresh water. Oceans are continually getting saltier every day right now. Mineral salts wash in off the ground. Evaporation takes out just the water. There's a giant distillation process going on. And the oceans are about 3.6% salt, though that changes worldwide in various locations, like the uh, uh, bay by Finland is fresh water and mixes with salt water. Anyway, so I think you'll see with the salt domes that are melting out from inside the earth, you find salt domes all over the world, huge plumes of salt came from deep down in the crust of the earth. These salt domes are leaching into the ocean at various rates in various places because of their proximity to the water. But the, at the known rate of salinity increase, the oceans are getting saltier. They could have easily gone from 100% fresh water 4,400 years ago. And then the animals have had to learn to adapt to salt water. Today, there are saltwater bass and freshwater bass. They might have had a common ancestor called a bass, called a fish, okay? There are saltwater crocodiles and freshwater crocodiles, and they might have had a common ancestor called a crocodile. That does not prove mosquitoes and whales are related. So I think the saltwater freshwater question is real tiny compared to the idea that fish came from a rock. I think that's a major thing you guys are completely overlooking, but you want everybody to believe that stuff as SpongeBob. So freshwater, saltwater, my answer is, I think the whole world was freshwater during the flood. It has gradually become salty in parts, oceans, and some animals have had to adapt to it. Most animals that live in salt water, it's a nuisance to them. They have to have some way of getting it out of filtering it out of their blood. Turtles excrete it through their eyes. Some have salt, special kidneys to get rid of the salt. They treat it through their urine. Most animals that do live in salt water, it's a nuisance. And they could be probably adapted back to fresh water over maybe a few decades or maybe over a few generations. A friend of mine had freshwater fish and saltwater fish aquarium in his house in Alabama. He slowly changed the salinity from 3.6 to 1.8 and lowered it in one, raised it in the other, and mixed all his fish together in two weeks. In two weeks, they adapted to 1.8 salinity. So I think that's so minor, though, compared to believing we all came from a rock. But go ahead. All right. So a uh, question for you, Conspiracy Cats. Uh -huh. uh, could you possibly explain the... Uh, mtDNA evidence, which is 99% similar worldwide, I believe is trying to say mitochondrial DNA, similar yeah. um, worldwide, 99%, pointing us back to one female ancestor just 6,000 years ago based on observed mutation rates. Yeah, well, he's talking about mitochondrial Eve, and I'm sure you've heard of mitochondrial Eve, haven't you, Ken? Now, mitochondrial Eve uh, is, like, first of all, if we're going to talk about, uh, there's a few things to mention here. If we're going to talk about mitochondrial Eve being 6,000 years ago, it's important to understand. And first of all, that date's wrong, and I'll come to why in a second. But it's important to understand that mitochondrial Eve is not the first uh, human female. She uh, it, She's a theoretical being that we can trace, you know, if we could trace back 
uh, through female lineage back to this one person. We, we get to mitochondria leave, but she, but she herself would have had peers. She would have had ancestors herself. So if she, if she was six thousand years old, she would have had ancestors uh, six thousand years ago. She would have had have had. Uh, I'll start again. Have had ancestors. So the Earth has to be older than six thousand years anyway. Now this whole charade about uh, mitochondria leave being only six thousand years old. Um, came from a, a paper. Now, what was the guy's name? Uh, Parsons, Thomas Parsons, 1997. Now, Thomas Parsons, 1997, uh, and, and his fellow uh, scientists, I'll say, are creationists. And they wrote one paper where they looked at the mutation rate and found the mutation rate in mitochondrial DNA to be higher than we thought. And what they thought was, if the mitochondrial DNA mutation rate is higher, then maybe we can rejig uh, mitochondrial leave and 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 they thought she's going to be six thousand years ago but i've had a look at that paper and i've read through it and what you'll notice is some really severe uh sleight of hand in that paper and anyone can google it parsons et al 1997 when you read it they'll talk about grandmothers and mothers and they'll talk about their grandchildren and their children they won't talk about granddaughters and daughters and the reason for that is they were including male offspring um, or hiding the fact that they were including male offspring. Now, what that means is because the, the mutations in the mitochondria are passed down the female line, uh, the mutations in the male mitochondria get lost. But if you're including the male mitochondria in a, in a selection of your research, then you're going to be including more mutations, but ones that aren't going to get passed on. So within any given generation, you can say, oh, the mutation rate is, is so much higher. But really, we know that we're taking the males out. You read that paper and you won't find the name. You won't find daughters or granddaughters. You'll find children and grandchild. And it was one paper by one creationist. So that's my answer to that. Ken, uh, do you have a opinion on that source of information and the analysis of it? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> okay. There right. we go. Uh, there. Okay. I've not read that paper. I'd be glad to read that. But uh, I'd, I'd like to ask Al a question. He says he knows that this mitochondrial Eve had ancestors. How could you possibly know that? Would you agree that all humans could have come from one human woman? Or were there multiple uh, ape-like ancestors that developed around the world? Or did, did we, do all the humans come from one ancestor, a, a man and a woman, whether they were ape or monkey or chimpanzee or baboon, uh, or, or common ancestor with them? Or were, did, this, did evolution happen multiple times or just one time and we all have, could all humans be traced back to one couple? I guess is my question. Well, you, you, I mean, you, you've done over 200 debates on evolution. You say you should teach evolution before you change mind in, in schools or, or, or something like that. You know the answer to that. You know what evolution is, and it's a change in the allele frequency in a population. So you know what the answer to that is. Um, so, no, it's, it's not a case of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. We had one female, and, and I'm not saying mitochondria leave is that person. Um, she, she, you know, she would be the person that we can theoretically track um, you know, everybody back to down the, the female line. And, and there's an equivalent male one as well. Is it what I can't remember what he's called now? Is he the Y chromosome Adam or something like that? But the, they're not meant to be Adam and Eve. They're not meant to be the one male and female that started everything off uh, at all. So, yes, they would have had ancestors. You know, they, they would have had someone to give birth to them. And, and that person would have had someone to give birth to them. Um, I think that the, the thing with mitochondrial Adam. And uh, mitochondrial Eve, sorry, is calling her Eve and calling Adam Y chromosome Adam because it gives the impression Adam and Eve that they're the first ones. Okay, you completely dodged the question, Al. I asked you a simple question. Did all humans come from a common woman and man, regardless of what you call them? Do we oh, have right. multiple human ancestors or one human pair of ancestors? Just don't dodge the question. Ask, answer the question. Well, like I said, you know, we, we would have multiple ancestors. We it's a, uh, Evolution is a change of frequency in a population. So, there were, so a whole there were a whole population of Eves and Adams or something that produced all the humans today. Are all the humans today interfertile? Are we, are, are, are we the same kind? Are humans today the same kind? I'm pretty sure we are. are. are Chinese, are they all interfertile? Would you consider Chinese and uh, African-American and uh, Norwegian the same kind of 
are we still are we still interfertile? I yes, ask you, you agree still- that if you go back in time, you had two parents, four grandparents, eight grandparents, eventually, eventually you reach a problem where there's three branches out where it includes everybody in the world. And then you got to go backwards to a pyramid coming back to two people. Were there two original humans or multiple original humans? How many original humans were there is my question. Well, how many, how big was the population in which the allele frequency changed over time? How big was that population? What a great question. And I'm quite, admit, I don't know how big that population was, you know, and I'd, I'd wish that you'd have said, you have no idea what isochron dating was, or you have no idea what ERBs are, rather than dodge it. I'm not going to dodge that. I don't know. We know what the theory of evolution is, and we know it's a change in allele population, the fre- allele frequency in a population over time. So there would have been a population, but I don't know how big it is. So evolution is a change in allele frequency. And do you understand how complex the GNA, DNA code is to start changing this? That's like saying a change in the Microsoft program that makes Microsoft PowerPoint. Little changes here and there are going to tweak it and turn it into you know, uh, an Apple program. It just doesn't happen. You're taking an unbelievably complex code and finding ways to tweak little changes and thinking this explains the origin of the code. It does not. What's well, you know, the origin of this complex code that we're dealing with? You're trying to change little allele frequencies. This is like a spelling error in a, in a dictionary of thousands of words. It's way beyond comprehension of how complex this is. And yet you can, just gloss over it. Like, of course it happened. Here we are. Can you explain to me what you uh, understand by the term allele frequency? Well, the no, I guess let's just set to save that for a separate debate. Also, I'll be no, 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 no. You should know. I think that's you're always important. welcome here. That's very well, important. I'm, I'm not prepared to handle that right now. I know what a little no, frequency no. is. I'm just, I'm just I haven't spoken my... over you all night. I haven't spoken over you all night, and I'll not do again. But for somebody that's had over 200 debates on evolution and who constantly uses straw man arguments like an elephant has never given birth to a deck chair or something like that. Right. You just use the term. allele. You, you've tried to poo poo evolution using the term allele frequency. I think it's really important. And I'm not I'm not going to leave this point. I'm going to stick on it and stick on it and stick on it. Can you please explain what you understand by the term allele frequency? Uh, no, I'd rather have you explain it and me and me uh, see if that's what I understand. It's been too no. long since I should be that free. You are the that's one who brought it up. I said, do you think what humans came from a common yeah, man and woman? We see okay. these variations and changes within the uh, frequencies of the alleles that they produce. And that therefore, that's what's happening here. Yeah, and that's, what's happening here. that's not what's happening here. I've asked you a direct question, and, I've, and I've, we've said there's no dodging, and I won't dodge from you. You, you poo pooed evolution using the term allele frequency, which means you should understand it. There's plenty of people watching in the chat. You know, I'm I'm interested to hear what your understanding, not what my understanding of allele frequency is, but what your understanding is, so I can better understand your argument. I'm not going to better understand your argument by telling you what I think allele frequency is, okay? But I can understand your argument if you tell me what your understanding is. So please, can you tell us all what your understanding of allele frequency is? No, I'd rather I'd rather wait for the separate debate. Let's do that in one. The this is the debate, this now, this is the debate now, on evolution. I love the debate was, what is the evidence for evolution? Ken, this is saying- a debate on evolution, and I'm sorry for speaking over you, but this is really important. This is a debate, and I, I do apologize for speaking over you, and I and I, and I will promise I will answer any question you want after this point. I re, you know, And I really do genuinely apologize for speaking over you, but it's, I hope you realize it's a critical, important point, okay? Because we couldn't talk about isochron dating because you didn't understand it, so so we moved on. We couldn't talk about ERVs because you said you don't know what they are, and we had to move on. But the very basic concept of allele frequency, we must surely know that you understand what that is, or at least I know what your understanding of that is, so we can move on in the conversation. You're not letting me, you know, how can right. you have over 200 debates and struggle with it? Right. You please tell us what allele yeah, frequency is. Then, then go ahead. Can- Okay, the chromosomes found in all living organisms, man has 46, different animals have different numbers of chromosomes, are unbelievably complicated, like a long twisted ladder. The, the rungs of the ladder would be the genes. These can have uh, the alleles, the, as a variant of a gene, these things can vary from person to person. So it, I'd have to do some refreshing, but the, the twisted ladder, the long twisted chromosome ladder, has the rungs across it, the uh, genes, 
there can be frequency differences between different people. You may have some insertions like an ERV. Let's do a whole debate just on that at another time. And I'll go, I don't have any slides ready for that right now. But are you saying that because there are frequency changes, changes in the frequency of the alleles of the genes in the DNA, that is proof that we all came from a rock? Is that, is that what you're trying to lead to? Ken, I think what I'm saying is, and I'm going to be really polite about the way I say this, um, because I do respect you've been very polite in, the, in this debate. And I understand that you've got a very strong uh, faith in creation, uh, which, which is fine. I've got no problem with that whatsoever. But I am going to say that you've got to stop arguing about the science of evolution if you can't articulate without having to look up what the term allele frequency means. That would be like me having a debate with somebody about Star Wars, which was the best Star Wars film, and them having to sit there and Google who Luke Skywalker was. That, that's the kind of level we're at. And, and, and I'm just going to leave it at that because I feel like I'm, I'll be bullying you if I carry on with that point. Uh, I actually feel quite bad for bringing that up already. So we won't talk about allele frequency. We won't talk about ERVs. We won't talk about isochron dating because you don't know about any of those things. So I'll let you bring up the next point and I'll answer it. Where can you give me any example from modern history, not from a fossil, where can any observable example be seen where any animal or plant has been observed to see it produce offspring that would be considered a different kind? I look, showed the definition of kind the other night in my YouTube channel, Kent Hovind Official. Uh, it shows up under the definition of species. One of the definitions is kind. And the Bible uses the word kind 20 times in the first seven chapters. So my simple, specific question, I don't want you to dodge it. What, what dodge. example can you show me in the literature where somebody has observed an animal or plant produce offspring that are a different kind? What is the best example you know of? Or does this so, happen too soon to see it? Oh, well, in most cases, it does happen so slow that we can't see it, right? In many cases, it does. Um, if we are now, you're going to have to correct me on what your definition of kind is. But if we're going by the definition of uh, kind, if you belong to the same kind you can bring forth, then when we looked at the ring species before and we showed that one species ended up with two animals that couldn't bring forth two species. And therefore, by your definition, not mine, by your definition, we've got different kind. Well, I think you showed yourself from your drawing, these two ring species came from an original warbler. And so you still have the same kind of animal. Alaska rabbits and Florida rabbits cannot interbreed because of various things that have happened. They're still rabbit. Is, is that example of a ring species of two different warblers that now cannot interbreed, you're saying that's enough evidence to conclude that warblers are related to cactus and mosquitoes. That's no, the conclusion you, you have to draw. You asked me you a very specific question which i answered the question you asked me was very specific you said according to your definition of kind can i give you an example where one species then creates another type of kind and i gave you a very specific example about the greenish warbler and the ring species which meant that they could no longer bring forth so by your definition they were different kind that was a question i was asking you then followed that up with something unrelated by saying is that enough information for me to believe i can't even remember what you finished with that question to believe that mosquitoes are related to evident uh, to elephants or something like that no, I will go back to ERVs, but we can't talk about that because you've said you don't know anything about it. I would go back. That, but you keep talking about it. Shut up. Talk about something else. Go ahead. We'll talk about that in a separate debate. Well, you yeah, but I've, brought, I've, prepared, play nice. play nice. I've prepared for this debate, Ken, by learning okay. you know, the facts and the science. And I've brought it, and, and, and now I'm being told I can't use it. But anyway, what's enough for me to, to believe that mosquitoes are related to evidence lies in the genetic analysis more so even than the fossil record it lies in the genetic analysis um it does seem we're very limited though on what we can talk about with the genetic analysis so we can set up a second debate and it can be all about genetics or we can set up a second debate and it can be all about radioactive dating either one of those is fine but you're asking me to to, to tell you something that you've already told me i'm not allowed to talk about uh, but I'll give you some other example. Um, the industrial melanism of the peppered moth. You talked about um, about car, uh, about uh, evolution, sorry, or natural selection. Are you familiar with the peppered moth example? Are, are you, oh, no, let me get this clear for the record here, Your Honor. Are you saying that the peppered moth that happened in England with the Industrial Revolution is evidence of evolution? I ask you, what example can you give where something produced something that would be considered a different kind? 
And those oh, are I both agree. Agree they're both laws. Oh, the, the peppered moth, the white and the dark peppered moth could still interbreed. Well, yeah, but it was but this is a, an example, a specific example of of uh of natural selection action. But if we look at um William Rice and uh can't remember his other name, Davis, uh they did a a, a 35 generation study on just Dros uh Drosophila. They took Drosophila from different environments that would interbreed, they bred them over 35 generations. And after those 35 generations, they would no longer interbreed after only 35 generations. And again, this is a paper you can look up. It's William Rice. And for the life of me, I can't remember his first name. Hopefully someone can Google it. Something Davis, William Rice and Davis, 35 generations of Drosophila. And they ended up with uh, species of Drosophila after just 35 generations that would not interbreed. Now, you are right that normally it does take a long time, which is why we, we can't observe it. But, you know, we see it in the lab all the time. We look at um, uh, superbugs, et cetera, as well. Uh, John Endler's guppy uh, experiment was a good one, although they, they would still interbreed, but they preferred not to. Well, let's, take, let's take one at a time here. Like I always ask, we do in debates, one topic at a time. If I don't know, I'll say I don't know. We can go on to something else. But the peppered moth in England, according to the story, the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s darkened the trees from coal. And mm -hmm. the dark moths blended in better, and the light moths were more likely to be uh, predation. Happened, it would be killed by the birds. The yeah. problem with that is they're still a moth, obviously. They're still the same kind of moth. They can still interbreed. It's the ratio of a population that has changed, not the moth. The moth is not <laughs> dark and light moths. They still have dark and light moths. That's not evolution. It's allele frequency. You say, there you go. You've got it. Allele frequency change. Right. Okay. Well, they can still interbreed, but that is a change in allele frequency. Uh, now, the thing is, I shouldn't have used that as an example of different kinds. I was. I wanted to talk about natural selection. And I agree that they they are the same kind of animal. Um, but I've given you exact. I've given you at least two. I've given you the Drosophila uh, that Rice and Davis uh, talk about that would not interbreed. I've given you the Greenish Warbler that again. Th they would not interbreed. So by your definition, I've answered the question. By your definition, they are animals that will no longer bring forth. Therefore, they are different kind. So you can maybe change your definition of what you think a kind is. But if you're going to stick with your definition, then I'll give you examples of it. So which one are you going to take? What's your fancy? Well, again, the burden of proof would be on me if I was asking for my theory to be taught in schools. I am not. You are demanding we all teach your religion in schools of evolution. And so the burden of proof is really on you. Ken, but we said, said no grandstanding. Okay. The moths already have dark and light in the genes. The allele frequency, let's suppose they were 95% light moths and 5% black. So the allele frequency changed, according to the story when they started burning coal in the factories. Now I have slides on this on my video four out of my 18,000 slides. I can't find it quickly right now, but I agree. They, they always were dark and light moths. The nothing has changed. They did not turn pink or green or purple. That's not in the gene code. All that happened was, according to the story, the allele frequency of those surviving changed. And now it's all dark moths surviving on the dark trees. Now, the truth of the matter is, one family did a study on this and said, after 40 years of watching the trees, they found two moths on the trees. They don't rest on the trees. They rest on the branches and under the leaves. The, 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 the whole story of the peppered moth is pure baloney. It's not evidence for evolution at all. Even if it was a change in allele frequency where they're now mostly dark instead of mostly light, it's still a moth. Your story about the warbler, it's still a warbler. Your story about Drosyphila, the guy raising a bunch of flies in the laboratory in 35 generations, he got two flies that won't breed with each other. They're still a fly. Still a well, fly. They won't, forth, they won't bring forth, Ken. If they won't bring forth, do they still satisfy your definition? Your definition of a kind. If those green, uh, those Greenish warbler, do they do they satisfy your definition of a kind, even though they won't bring forth? I would say a seven foot man and a three foot tall pygmy probably could not bring forth either. But they're still the same kind, yes. I think the warblers that are on the opposite sides of the ring are still a warbler. I think the Drosophila, are, I think they're still the same kind. There may be mechanical reasons. I don't know why they can't bring forth, but they're still obviously came from a common ancestor. The ancestor could obviously bring forth. So yes, I'll stick by that. I think it's still obvious to a four-year-old, they're still the same kind. That's not evolution. So we change our definition of kind now from animals that can bring forth to animals that might not be able to bring forth. Um, well, I, 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 
originally could bring forth. Noah probably had 8,000 kinds of animals on the ark. He probably only had two warblers. They've now developed into different species that somebody's decided to call a different species, but they're still a warbler. If that's the best you've got as evidence that we all came from amoeba, I think you guys need to go start a private school and teach it there and not teach it in public school. Well, let me just address that again, because you keep, you keep going back to if that's the best you've got. Can I just reiterate for everyone watching, for anyone that's new, I actually brought a lot more, but we're not allowed to talk about ERVs because Kent doesn't know anything about it. We're not allowed to talk about isochron dating because Kent doesn't know anything about it. I had to teach you the term allele frequency, which I'm glad to see you using now. So it's not that I haven't got evidence. It's that we've decided we have to leave that for another debate because you won't talk about it now, which is fine. I'm not expecting to be an expert on everything, but please stop saying that that's the best I've got when the stuff I have brought, you aren't prepared to talk about. So please okay, don't so be disagreeing with that. Let me, uh, let, me, let me summarize for the audience here. The best you have is ERVs, some insertion in an already incredibly complex code. Something's been inserted in that code by a virus. And that is evidence that we're all related. I found my peppered moss slides right from the textbooks, Kettlewell's Moss. They talk about this as evidence for evolution, industrial melanism. This is covered on my video number four. It's in all the textbooks, zoos, museums have displays about this. The claim is that it changed the percent, the allele frequency, the percentage that were black versus the percentage of white. I'll put together more on that if you'd like. That moths have no tendency to choose matching backgrounds. The moth doesn't care what he lands on. Kettlewell's results have never been replicated in further studies. The shift in population did occur but before the lichens grew on the polluted trees. We cover all this on video four with lots of stuff, uh, uh, references. Let me find some here. Uh, the evolution of the peppered moth is an evolutionary instance of directional color change in the moth population as a cons consequence of air pollution. They're using this as, as uh, evidence for evolution. It's simply not true. What happened was the allele frequency, the percentage of dark versus percentage of light, that we've got dark and light people today in Alabama where I live. They can still interbreed. We don't have any green people or, or orange people. So the frequency, the, the only, the, all, all that could happen is choice of something already existing in the gene code. Was there anything new added to the gene code of the warbler? Was there anything new added to the gene code of the fly, the drosophila? Was anything new added to the gene code? Something new has to be added to change an amoeba to a whale a whole bunch of things have to be added to the gene code of the amoeba. And do you believe we all had a single common ancestor that was a single cell? That's what the textbooks teach. I'm assuming that's the religion you follow, that we all came from a single cell creature. You have to add a whole lot of stuff to that cell to get legs and wings and lungs and digestive system and reproductive system. And, and it takes a long time, you know. Oh, time. There you go. Okay. And it takes a long time, which, which Icecron uh, dating proves. But, um, you know... I'm just uh, struggling with the point that, yeah, you are right that the peppered moth is an example of natural selection, but they are the same kind. We've, you know, we've talked about that. Um, I'm not holding out massive amount of hope, but are you happy with ubiquitous genes? Do you know what ubiquitous genes are? Define the term as you understand it. Uh, genes that are specific for one particular creature. Is that what you're saying? No. A ubiquitous gene um, is, so, or sometimes are often referred to as housekeeping genes. Have you heard of those? I'm sorry, I could not hear that. What kind of genes? They are sometimes referred to as housekeeping genes. Housekeeping genes. Genes that, that maintain stability. Is that what you're saying? No. So like a ubiquitous gene is one that can take many, many different forms. And they are um, they are in a, a, an enormous range of organisms to perform a specific right. function. So some of them may perform functions like help ion channels in a membrane work, you know, which you know, all mammals and reptiles, except may need to have, you know, so, something like that. Now, these genes, these ubiquitous genes, they can take many, many different forms. All right. So when you're looking at the coding of them, you know, the amino acid sequences that they produce, um, they can take many, many different forms, produce many similar free, uh, many similar sequences, uh, but still perform exactly the same function. So what I, I'm saying is, that if I have one that operates an ion channel in my membrane, there's no need for it to be the same ubiquitous gene as th that you've got to perform the same function. Does that make sense? Right. So are you saying the uh, genes that, that can perform these various functions or these various genes that perform the same function are 
is, is not an example of a pretty intelligent design creating this? I mean, that sounds pretty amazing. Uh, if you have a tool that can do a variety of functions, uh, I think somebody had to design that tool. Yes, but I've got just I have not finished the point yet. So the the point is uh, essentially this: it really should not matter. It shouldn't matter at all which version of that ubiquitous gene you've got, or I've got, or a pigeon has got, or an elephant has got, or whatever. But what we find, and this uh, I've got a slide on this, but I'll not get Jared to pick up the slides uh, for me. Uh, what we find is that within uh, when we look at the fossil record again, and we compare that. Uh, we, we, we do the genetic analysis and we look for these specific ubiquitous genes, we can find that with our closest ancestors, we share the same versions of these genes. But with our more distant ancestors, we share that we, 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 we don't share the same version of those genes. But yet when we go up that phylogenetic tree and we start looking at different clumps and clusters, those that are close together, as predicted by other genetic analysis and as predicted by dating techniques and as predicted by fossil records they have the same ubiquitous genes as each other uh, you know closer related species even even though there's no need for that to happen so only two things are possible here one is that evolution has taken place and these genes have been passed down um, as evolution says and that's why similar species have the same ubiquitous genes or creation occurred and for some reason for some reason God has decided to trick us all. And he's tricked us all by taking the same type of housekeeping gene for whatever ion channel we're talking about and put it in all primates, take a different one and put it in all elephants, take a different one and put right, and, 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 and all rabbits and hers and put one in there. Why would he trick us? Why would he you're do giving, that with these signposts? Now, now, you're giving two false answers asking which is correct, like saying which is correct, uh, three and four is 12 or three and four is 15. If you give two possible choices, neither of which is correct. Could it be oh, that the gene, could it be that the genetic similarity in these creatures is an example of a common designer? I think you'll find all internal combustion cars driving on the highways here in Alabama have gas tanks. Some have gas tanks in the front, some have gas tanks in the side, some have gas tanks in the back. They've all got gas tanks. That proves they all evolved from a skateboard. That's the kind of logic you're using. The fact that there are similarities in all these life forms is proof of a common designer. It doesn't prove a common ancestor or that the designer is trying to trick us. Is the fact that General Motors gas tank is in the trunk in the back and Ford gas tank is in the trunk? Oh, they're trying to trick us. No, that's a good design that works. The gene code is beyond complexity that we can understand. Unbelievable. One cell is more complex than your whole country of England. With all the infrastructure you've been developing for thousands of years over there, one single cell is more complicated than that. The code found in your DNA, one person's DNA, if this was stretched out and unwound the chromosome, your DNA would reach from Earth to the moon and back 500,000 times. Yes, and you would. think that came by chance. That's a complicated code. So let, let's let's just review that. You know, you just said you've kind of made my point for me there. You said, is this it, are those ubiquitous genes, those housekeeping genes? Are they not evidence of a common designer? So let's say there's a there's a common designer who has who's done exactly what you said. For some reason, if if that's happened, because it doesn't matter which of these housekeeping genes, you know, we could all have the same one. We could all have the same one and they'd all work in all of us. Right. All these organisms. But you're saying that a common designer, rather than put the same gene in every animal, has decided to create multiple versions of this gene and then group them together and say, all these primates, right, that seem to look very similar, I'm going to give them this version of the gene. And, you know, these birds that look a little bit different, I'm going to give them this version of the gene and so on and so on. And he spread out all these housekeeping genes when he could have given us all the same one. So when we start learning genetic analysis, we can look at that evidence and think, what? the evolution was real like you know by your by your definition like if if a creator has done that he set out to deliberately trick us because we don't need all those different things well i guess if i was god and i was designing life forms i would produce a lot of different things in there that would look like a um, similar designer but somebody could interpret otherwise because he knows there are people like you who are going to hate him and not want to believe he exists and it would be enough to trip him up, like Sherlock Holmes, you know, a clue that leads the wrong direction here. Not deceitful, just he knows your hatred for in your heart for him. 
And he says, well, I'm going to give them something to trip on then. And then when they finally do understand, oh, no, I missed it, then it'll be too late. I don't know. But I, I think there are answers to all of these. But you're dealing with a code that is beyond imagination with how complex it is. And I would stick by my argument that the similar, the similar gene code is evidence of a common designer, like the code of Microsoft Word and Microsoft PowerPoint have thousands of lines of similar code. Well, um, unfortunately, the, the DNA code is, is a times more complex than a Microsoft program. My, all, all computer codes are two, two digits, zeros and ones. DNA is four bit code, C-A-T-G, which makes it orders of magnitude more complicated. No. It's, it's, it's well, the, the fact is with the with the human genome project we um you know we we have fully mapped the, the human genome so it's big but we we know where all the genes are we know where, where everything is but i'll pick you up on something else you've made the assumption i said to you my beliefs at the beginning of this are irrelevant but you've just jumped to the assumption because i'm arguing against your standpoint that i must be an atheist all right yeah I, 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 you're right i am assuming that you don't want the Bible to be true and you don't want the creation story to be true because it might affect your lifestyle. That's just my assumption. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't affect my lifestyle um, uh, uh, at all. But, but sorry, like, why, why, why could it not be? And I'm not saying, you know, my beliefs are irrelevant, but I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Why could it not be that I believe in God? But I believe because God left all the signposts, hang on, because he left all the signposts of genetic analysis, he left all the signposts of the fossil records, he left all the signposts of everything we've discussed today, including the ice cream date and except, you know, he's left all those signposts. Why can he not have created life as it is now through the mechanism that science has revealed? Because science is revealing stuff, whether you like it or not. So why would he put all that stuff there to trick us? The mechanism that science has revealed, science means knowledge. All the knowledge of all the farmers in the history of the world tells us cows produce cows. Has science now revealed that cows and, uh, and mosquitoes are related? Where did science if, if, if prove that? I think you have a vivid imagination. You and some of make good friends, but this is imaginary. Nobody's ever seen an animal produce a different kind. Never. Well, let's, let's just science remind everyone about that. We, we are going to have another debate where we use genetic analysis because, remember, okay. we've already said that I'm not allowed to use a genetic analysis because you don't understand okay. it. So we're okay. talking about that. Well, that's we what hours. Al, just a minute. We've got two oh, hours yeah. after the program to do in 30 minutes. Can we call it here and you give your last word? I'll give my last word. That'd be, and then the that'd be fine. Yes. That'd be great. Thank you, okay. both of you. Go ahead. But, Go ahead. You went first. Finish up. What's your final word? All right. My last word is that I opened up the debate by saying that I want to look at both sides of the story and which one seems to fit science better. And when we look at the, the creation side, you know, we've heard nothing even vaguely scientific that, that really lends us to believe that these uh, these strata with these nicely organized uh, fossils, uh, you know, in increasing complexity could appear. We've, we've, we've not heard anything scientific from the creation side at all. Um and I, so I stand by the fact that the fossil record, genetic analysis, radioactive dating, and two of those three things we've not been allowed to talk about, uh, they they are more than ample to show that evolution uh, is more scientific than creation. Okay, I would stand by what I said. The Bible says clearly that all the plants and animals are going to bring forth after their kind. And I think every four-year-old on the planet would tell you both warblers are still a bird. And both the flies they got that can't interbreed anymore are still a fly. But I don't think you've given any scientific evidence that flies and warblers are related. You can believe that if you wish, but that is a religious belief. It is not science. I think all the science that we see, science is what we observe, study, test, and demonstrate. All the science tells us flies produce flies. Now, whether they can be classed as a new species, because you can all, you, and this is messed with in the laboratory. Uh, I think the Bible has been demonstrated, to, has not been demonstrated to be proven wrong. They bring forth after their kind. A four-year-old will tell you those warblers are still a bird. So I don't think you've demonstrated at all that because that warblers and flies have a common ancestor, which was a, a single-cell creature, which came from a rock, which came from a dot of nothing. And we're not allowed to talk about the Big Bang, which is part of your theory. We're not allowed to talk about abiogenesis, which is, has to be part of your theory. We're not allowed to talk about variations beyond the little bitty variation like a warbler. We're not allowed to talk about that because that's macro evolution. It doesn't happen. I think you have a religious belief. You have very strongly held this religious belief. Lots of people have strongly held religious belief, but that's all you have is a religion when you believe warblers and flies and bananas and cactus are related. I, I, I feel sorry for you for believing such a thing. But I'll, I'll think 
There are things I don't understand about God's amazing creation. I think that's normal. Nobody knows what gravity is, okay? And nobody knows what light is. We know what it does. It can measure the speed, but we don't know what it is. But I choose to stand in awe of the designer and say, wow, God, this DNA code you made is amazing. I can praise God for the creation he made. And, and, and I, 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 the doubts I have or the questions I don't have answered yet, I'm going to say, Lord, I don't understand, but I trust you. Rather than until I understand, I'm not going to trust you. That's a choice everybody's got to make. Anyway, drdino.com, my website and our YouTube, Kent Hovind Official. And come visit, uh, Al, come visit Dinosaur Adventureland. We'll give you a tour of the place, put you up here for free, feed you, and show you around our science center and take any questions. You can sit right here beside me. We'll do the debate on ERV. So you sit right here. That's awesome. very kind. Very kind of you. Take care. It agrees here today, Fahrenheit. This has been amazing. I've watched, like I said, so many of Dr. Hoven's debates, and this one has been wow. Jared, what do you think? To coin one of my nemesis is on another channel here. It has been fascinating. Yeah. Interesting. That that as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes. Thank you guys so much. It's been wonderful. Everybody in the chat, thank you for coming. There's gonna be an after show in the Discord following. Well, Followed by a live after show, which will be my regularly scheduled uh, Veterans Talk Weekly, which will be open to more participants to facilitate anyone out there in the audience who would like to vent and express themselves as a result of the wonderful interaction that we've had here tonight. Again, right. thank you for coming, guys. All right. Thanks, Ken. Bye-bye. Okay.